You are listening to Chosen Mate, Lion Shifter Romance, Cyber Mates Book 5. Written by Candace Ayers, narrated by Maeve York. Chapter 1. Ellen Waving a water-stained magazine back and forth in front of my face to ward off the heat, I tripped over a plastic tote, landed on an air mattress, and catapulted myself head first into my bedroom closet. Fortunately, I sustained no serious injuries. I took a hanger to the forehead, but I'd purged wire hangers years ago after watching Mommy Dearest, so it didn't leave a mark. My entire cottage resembled a war zone. In the two months I'd lived in Sunkissed Key, I'd already dealt with a small army of rodents, a palmetto bug infestation, and now a burst water pipe. Despite the 90-degree heat, I had to leave the air conditioning off and the windows open to dry out my soggy life. Belongings. I meant soggy belongings. Damp clothes hung over every surface. Hastily packed plastic totes dotted the living room, and trash bags stuffed with waterlogged books, papers, and magazines were piled near the door. The landlord was apparently vacationing in Jamaica. Who vacationed in Jamaica when they already lived in the Florida Keys? That made zero sense. And where were my red pumps? I continued to dig through plastic bins and navigate treacherous piles to no avail. Finally, I found them buried in the back of my closet, under a sleeping bag and an old set of luggage. Once my outfit was completed, I did a spin in front of the full-length mirror. The black cocktail dress was tasteful but daring, form-fitting but not skin-tight, and it fell just above mid-thigh to reveal a decent amount of leg. A little overdressed for ladies' night at Mimi's, but I looked good. Good enough to catch a husband. To quote Mildred Larson Pierce, a.k.a. my mother, which was exactly my intent. My solo search had thus far proven to be futile, if not downright nauseating, but tonight was another opportunity to beg, bribe, and cajole Parker Pettit. Her cybermate sight was my best chance at landing a shifter mate. I stifled a yawn, sucked back the last swallow of my fifth iced coffee, and entered the one room in the house that was pristine, the kitchen. I'd been awake sixteen hours, most of which had been spent working on blogging and video editing. I slid the tripod back just a little to catch the perfect camera angle before filming myself as I removed my special recipe homemade chocolate fudge brownies from the oven and rested the pan of ooey gooey heavenly goodness on a cooling rack. They smelled incredible. I was tempted to steal a little nibble but I already shouldered a truckload of guilt courtesy of a master guilt tripper, my very own Mommy Dearest. According to Mildred Larson Pierce, baked goods were a highly effective weapon in a single woman's arsenal, but they were meant to lure men in, not let seams of dresses out. I stared into the camera. And here they are, folks. The most mouth-wateringly delicious brownies you've ever tasted. You can find this recipe in my new cookbook, Ellen's Tasty Treats, available now on Amazon. I'll have the link below in the description. I scowled at the brownies. They looked delectable. They smelled scrumptious. Screw it. Before I could stop myself, I cut a small square from the corner and popped it into my mouth. Then I did a bouncing dance with my mouth open and my hand flapping in front of my face to fan the molten chocolate while it played hot potato with my tongue. After finally managing to swallow it, I braced my hands on the counter, drawing in deep breaths. I'll edit that part out. Another deep breath, then a bright smile for the camera. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and tap the bell notification icon up in the corner to be notified when a new video has been released. Thank you for watching. Bye. My tongue tingled from the burn. There was a real chance I'd maim myself some day in some stubbornly defiant act. But damn, those brownies were good.
After taking a couple of still shots of the plated brownies for Instagram and my blog, I wrapped the platter in foil and headed to my VW Bug for the drive to Mimi's. Chapter 2. Dylan I've been sleeping with Tom Morris, and he's begging me to become his first wife. Brittany was trying to get under my skin. It was working, just not in the way she intended. I couldn't care less if she slept with Tom, Dick, or Harry, or Tom's Harry Dick. She could bang every lion shifter in the state of Florida for all I cared. I just wanted her to shut the hell up. My head was beginning to throb. And where I go, Ashley goes. She pointed emphatically to Ashley, who was sitting angrily on my sofa, tapping her foot and giving me the evil eye. I was about to toss Brittany some snippy comeback like, I'll call a cab for your Brexit, but I really didn't want to add fuel to her fire. She already seemed to be casing my apartment looking for something to throw at me. I simply nodded to her, then to Ashley. My congratulations to you both. Apparently that was the wrong thing to say. Ugh, you are such an asshole. Well, what the fuck did she want? She threw the TV remote at my head. I ducked. It missed. So she picked up a vase and hurled that. Missed again. When the vase shattered to the ground, she stomped over and swung a few punches. You just let us go that easily. I held my hands up to fend off the attack. I would, uh, support you in any direction you felt was best for your future happiness. Is that so? Her finger wagged in my face. Well, you're not getting rid of us. It's time you man-beast up and make this group an official pride. Told you, Britt, I'm not prepared to form a pride just yet. I took a step back in case she decided to Mike Tyson me again. Oh, really? Well, I suggest you get prepared. I have power among the local lionesses. I can blacklist you. Then, good luck finding any wives for your pride that aren't but ugly or older than dirt. She wasn't issuing idle threats. I knew that. So I pretended to care. Brittany was perfect first wife material. She was a bitch, ruthless, cunning, and she took no shit. I couldn't stand her. It was mutual she couldn't stand me either. Not that that mattered in lion shifter prides. Romantic love was non-existent among our kind. For us, it was about the three Ps, power, prosperity, and prestige. That was how a male built his pride, and what a female looked for when she was considering joining one. Oh, and a fourth, polygamy. Brittany and Ashley glowered at me, waiting for me to say something, but I was done. The tension was too thick, and I wasn't in the mood to deal with them. I snatched my truck fob off the hall table. I have things to do this afternoon. You two lock up when you leave. I gestured to the shards of broken glass and returned their glares one at a time. And clean that mess up before you go. As I swung open the door, Brittany decided to get in one last jab. Make no mistake, this is an ultimatum, Dylan King. Last straw. I turned to face her and let loose an earth-shattering roar that shook the windows in their panes. Shit, I hated to do that. Things like that were difficult to explain to the neighbors. Both Brittany and Ashley shrank back as the wave of dominance rolled over them and flooded the room. Their bodies slumped and they bared their necks in submission. I wasn't as big a bastard as it sounded. Male lion shifters were expected to put on a show of dominance in a situation like this. It was the only way we maintained respect among our kind. Massaging my temple, I strode out to my truck and climbed in. Brittany was no different from most lionesses. All she cared about were those three Ps, and I had them. Power inherited from my father, prestige as the only son of the chancellor of the lion shifter community, and financial prosperity from selling my tech company for a bundle a few years back. I was considered a catch among our kind. Unfortunately. It was why Brittany chose me, Ashley. Well, the only thing Ashley wanted was Brittany. I didn't give a rat fart about Brittany and her power to blacklist me. 
although I knew she'd do it if it served her purpose. The thing that felt like a kick in the nuts was that Brittany and Ashley were right. I couldn't keep putting it off. It was time for me to start a pride. Chapter 3, Ellen There are scores of dating sites for you to choose from. Parker shoveled another of my chocolate fudge brownies in her mouth. She raised herself to her knees on the stool and leaned across the bar top to see around Layla and Grace, who were standing between us deep in conversation. She waved her smartphone, jabbed at the screen a few times, then slid it across the bar toward me. There you go, Bliss Match, the number one most trusted and highest rated dating site for humans. I sighed and glanced briefly at the phone without reaching for it. No thanks. Parker kept the phone where it was, midway between us, even though I sat three bar stools down. She didn't give up. She leaned farther, examining one of the profiles. Well, would you look at this hunka hunka? Pinching the screen to zoom in on his full body pick, she squinted at the crotch area. Whoa, and check out that bulge of burning love. I winced and looked away quickly, but she kept going. Michael, six foot two inches, 30 years old, likes long walks in the park and watching the sunset on a sandy beach. Oh, he volunteers at an animal shelter? Arden, seated to my right, shook her head. Parker, you know she wants a shifter. She's only said it a million times. Arden Richardson, soon to be Arden Bennett, and I had been best friends for over a decade, ever since we were the only two flat-chested, late-blooming dweebs among the crowd of beautifully blossoming pre-socialites at Fuller Academy, an upscale prep school for girls. Can't say I blame her. Heidi was working the bar and slid a mixed drink in front of me. They're protective as all get out if you can get past the sometimes irrational jealousy. Plus, the sex is off the charts. Layla waggled her brows. You got that right. Gray does this thing in bed. I know it doesn't sound anatomically possible, but just hear me out. Ew, TMI again, Layla. That's my brother you're talking about. Grace clamped her hands over her ears. La 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 la, I can't hear you. Layla flashed a devilish grin. I love doing that to her. Arden and I exchanged glances. Mine frustrated, hers sympathetic. Come on, she nodded to the center of the room. Let's dance. In what seemed like no time, I was three drinks in and three sheets to the wind. On the dance floor, or the space we'd single-handedly turned into a dance floor, I was sandwiched between Fern and Megan, working my hips to the beat and sipping my drink, a fruity concoction called Tight Snatch. I tried and failed to ignore the fact that I was the only single woman at our ladies' night gathering, and that all the other women were mated to shifters. Someone's phone is ringing. Layla waved my pink jeweled encrusted phone case in the air. It's, Layla looked at the name on the screen, Mom. I grimaced and stumbled slightly as I grabbed for my phone. Pushing decline, I grinned at Layla. Let's ignore that, shall we? That might be wise in your condition, considering you just tripped over air. The phone started up again, almost immediately, and I frowned down at it, realizing it wasn't going to stop. Swearing under my breath, I forced a smile. I guess I'm answering. It's either that or she'll notify the island authorities she suspects foul play and have them search my home for clues to my abduction. By the time I edged past the crowd, stepped outside and took a few wobbly strides toward the ocean, my mother had already hung up and called back again. Mom? Instantly her shrill voice greeted me. Why haven't you been answering your phone? Where are you? I've called no less than eight times. I'm out with friends. I didn't hear my phone. You're at a bar? I groaned, holding the phone away from my face so she wouldn't hear. So, you're drunk? When I hesitated, she jumped on it. Oh, goodness, Eleanor, really? Acting the fool in public, highly unattractive. 
Mom, is there a reason you called eight times? I tried to focus, but in my drunken state, the phone slipped from my fingers and landed in front of my shoes. When I bent at the waist to retrieve it, I couldn't seem to get a good grip on it. It ended up slipping from my fingers and burying itself in the sand. I could hear my mother's voice as I worked to dig the phone out. Eleanor? Eleanor? Wobbling, I lost my balance entirely and toppled head over heels, splitting the seam of my dress and sending a red pump flying through the air. Lovely. I finally managed to reclaim the phone just in time to watch the screen go dark as the battery died. Releasing a half-groan, half-sigh, I rolled over, let my head fall back on the sand, and stared up at the crescent moon. Since I was too drunk to drive, and I couldn't call a taxi with a dead phone, I figured I'd just lie there. I didn't want to go back inside with all the mated women. The evening temperature had cooled slightly, and a gentle breeze rolled in off the ocean. It was a perfect night for lovers. I sighed loudly up at the stars. I'm ready, universe. I'm ready for mine. My dream, for as long as I could remember, was to have a family. Diapers and car seats and date nights and meatloaf Mondays. I'd been searching for Mr. Wright for much of my 27 years of existence, but all I'd managed to find were dick pic texters, the chronically unemployed, and man-child porn addicts living in their parents' basement and playing video games in their underwear. If it were a field of study, I'd hold an advanced degree in heartache, abandonment, and bad choices. When Arden told me about shifters, fiercely loyal, protective, steadfast, and attentive, I moved to Sunkissed Key in a heartbeat. Shifters never abandoned a mate, ever. I wanted a shifter. I didn't care if he dropped his dirty clothes a foot from the hamper, or if he forgot our anniversary, or if he had to be reminded three times to take out the trash, as long as he was a shifter. So, Michael, who volunteers at the animal shelter, and probably feeds homeless orphans, and escorts little old ladies across the street in his spare time, however handsome and saintly he may be, was not my type. I sat up slowly and shook the sand out of my hair. Since every cybermate's applicant was carefully screened, I couldn't get access without going through Parker. That meant I was stuck searching the half-rate shifter dating sites for my mate until I could convince her to let me be the first non-shifter to join. I wasn't giving up on my dream. I'd wear her down eventually. Chapter 4 Dylan The noonday Florida sun was high in the sky as I drove from Miami down to Sunkissed Key. I still had some time before a face-to-face with a client, so I pulled into the marina to see if Patton had actually gone to work or if he was spending the day lounging on his boat. Over the past few years, I'd spent way too much time with Patton just to put space between me and horny lionesses. Castaway was in its slip. Patton was stretched out on a deck chair with the brim of his hat pulled down over his face, sawing logs. I envied the fucker. He was recently mated and blissfully happy. Climbing aboard quietly, I grabbed a beer from the cooler beside him, shook it, and held it over his torso before opening it. As the ice-cold foam shot out across his sun-baked stomach, Patton startled hard. His arms flailed and his chair tipped. He did a tuck and roll, ending in a crouch position, eyes glowing, ready to shift and go to battle. Until his brain registered, it was me, doubled over, clutching my middle, and laughing hysterically. Hilarious. Fucking hilarious, pussycat. He grabbed a towel and dried himself. You come to start a brawl? I sniffed and set the beer down to shift. Hell, I was game for a brawl. It had been too long since I'd had a good knockdown drag out. He held his hands in front of him. Wait, we can't, not on the boat. The repairs to Castaway after the last time we tussled ate a chunk of my savings. Mariah will have my ball sitting on a shelf floating in a jar of formaldehyde if it happens again. Ha, huh. I seem to remember you ribbing Jake about this very thing not too long ago. Now who's pussy whipped? Yeah, yeah, I've since seen the error of my previous ways. 
Patton reached for a beer and slumped back into his deck chair just as his phone buzzed. He picked it up, grinned like a kid on Christmas morning, and his fingers flew over the keyboard as he shot off a reply. I took a swig of my beer and leaned on the rail staring out at the marina for several minutes. Patton looked up. Something got you down? I grunted and shrugged. Brittany's having a shit fit issuing ultimatums. Patton scratched his head. Brittany? I thought her name was Ashley. That's the other one. He threw his head back and laughed. Dissension in the harem. The player's player has trouble in paradise. More women, more problems, I guess. Eh, lover boy? While Patton grinned like my life was a rom-com, I just rolled my eyes. Jake and Patton seemed to think I was a player. They really had no clue. I'll never understand how that works, man. Don't they get jealous? Of what? Our matings are emotionless. We all grew up accepting our way as the norm. Hold up. Emotionless? What does that mean exactly? It means those goo-goo eyes you make every time you so much as think about Mariah aren't in our wheelhouse. Despite the fact that I'm labeled with every man whore nickname you and Jake can come up with, I'm not one. I have females, yes, but believe it or not, I never had much choice in the matter. It's the lion shifter way, and it's what has been expected of me since the doctor slapped my ass and said it's a boy. You're shitting me, he scratched his head. How come you never told me this before? I told you we don't have mates. Yeah, right, you did. Truth was, I had seen a lion form a mate bond once. It had been one-sided and devastating for the one who bonded to a mate, unable to reciprocate the intense feelings. Absolutely devastating. I shrugged. Have you ever known me to date anyone but a lioness? He took a swig of his beer. There's a name for that, man. Species prejudice. I snorted a laugh. Nah, it's not that at all. No other species could handle our lifestyle. Can you imagine what Mariah would say if you told her you were required to have at least two more wives? Patton spit out his beer and started cough laughing. She'd hang my testicles from her rearview mirror like a pair of fuzzy dice. Not that I would ever want anyone else. My leggy mahogany goddess is all I need or want. I sighed and plopped down on the deck chair next to his. Dude, you don't know how lucky you are. Hell yeah, I do. His grin stretched from ear to ear. Luckiest man alive. He picked up his cell phone again, laughed aloud at what he read on the screen and tapped out another text. To Mariah, no doubt. Tell your better half I said hello. Patton just nodded. Why aren't you at work today? Patton tossed his phone on his lap, sighed, and folded his arms behind his head. I'm on vacation. Again? Didn't you just have a vacation last month? Why are you here again? Shaking my head, I chugged the rest of my beer before getting up to go. I was killing time before my meeting, but I'll let you get back to your afternoon nap, Grandma. Talk at you later. Patton waved without looking up. He'd already gone back to texting and grinning like a lovesick fool. Ever since the conversation with Brittany and Ashley, starting a pride had been weighing heavily on my mind. Procreation was considered a requirement in our community, and at 34, most male lion shifters my age already had several wives and a handful of cubs. I released a heavy sigh. A sourness churned my gut. It was time to suck it up and do my duty, make it official, take Brittany and Ashley as my first and second wives. I'd let them know tonight as soon as I returned to Miami. Chapter 5, Ellen Five minutes ago, I would have sworn I'd sunk as low as humanly possible in regard to my love life, or lack thereof. I was outfitted in full Klingon battle gear for a blind date at a local Trekkie convention with Jim Bob Cooter, a 40-year-old hog shifter whose gropy hands were attracted to my chest like my breasts had their own gravitational pull. That was rock bottom, right? Couldn't get much lower, right? Wrong. 
Apparently, I also had a sub-basement level built of pathetic desperation because I was now running from Porky Pervert like my life depended on it. This was at least partly Parker's fault. I ducked into Latte Love mere seconds before Jim Bob rounded the corner. Hide, hide. Scanning the coffee shop, I was about to beeline it to the bathroom when a frazzled-looking mom balancing a baby on her hip and wrangling a brood of pint-sized rug rats blocked the entrance. Crap! There was no way I could get around them quickly without inflicting casualties. Plan B, plan B. Come on, Ellen, formulate. The place was so full of potted mini palms it resembled a tropical rainforest, but none would effectively conceal a Klingon warrior in full battle gear. When I heard the bell over the door chime, I did the only thing I could think to do. I leaped three feet to my left and hid behind the largest man in the crowd. Eyes closed, breath held, I waited. You okay? I startled hard at the question, not just because of my jangled nerves. It was his voice, deep and soothing, with velvety undertones. I bit my lip and raked my gaze over the stranger I was using as a human shield. My eyes traveled up, way up, over a large, heavily muscled physique to a handsomely chiseled face. His killer smile displayed perfect, gleaming white teeth and crinkled the corners of his green-gold eyes. His smile set my panties on fire, and I knew who he was instantly. My heart rate went ballistic, tapping out a staccato rhythm against my ribcage. My mate. The man was my mate. If you're avoiding Captain Picard, he's gone. Huh? I leaned to the right, craning my neck to search the shop. Sure enough, no Jim Bob. But several women at nearby tables were practically drooling in their mochaccinos as they openly ogled my mate. Yes, ladies, I know he's hot. Back off. Ah, I was just trying to get away from a bad date that... I hesitated. My fingers fiddled with my uniform belt. I shrugged. Not important. He studied me looking puzzled. Not exactly the reaction I'd expected from my mate. Shouldn't he be more enthusiastic? Maybe he was just as overwhelmed as I was. Yeah, that was probably it. I mean, here we were, meeting each other for the first time. It was completely unexpected for both of us. What should I say? I should probably introduce myself. Yeah, right. I'm Ellen. Ellen Larson. Your mate. He nodded. Dylan King. He kind of looked confused. And then it dawned on me. Duh. Who could blame him for the confusion? His first glimpse of his mate, and she's dressed in a 1960s sci-fi cosplay getup, acting like a psychotic date dodger. I looked down at my outfit and sighed. But while I mentally awarded myself the nerdiest nerd in Nerdsville trophy, Dylan suddenly flashed a megawatt grin. Nook-neck. I inhaled sharply. Did he just? Did he really? No way. My jaw dropped. My heart raced. You speak Klingon? My hand flew to my chest. Before he had a chance to respond, a gruff, raspy smoker's voice with a New York accent came from somewhere behind Dylan. Hey, sis, back of the line. What are you trying to pull? I leaned to see around Dylan's huge form. A little guy behind Dylan, whose face looked like a pickled beet that had been left in the sun too long and grew a throbbing vein on its temple, was gesturing with his thumb to the line behind him. Dylan glared over his shoulder at the man, and a low growl rumbled from his chest. That did not sound good. Not at all. I knew Dylan was a shifter, although I didn't know what kind. Was it rude to ask? I had no idea. That was one of the things I should have discussed with Arden and Flynn. Shifters were highly protective of their mates, that I knew. Based on Dylan's menacing expression, Pickled Beat was a hair's breadth from having his head plucked off his body. I had to take a second to let that sink in. My mate was about to defend me. That was swoony, no lie. Our How We Met story was one I planned to tell our children and grandchildren for decades to come.
In order for it to not include spurting blood, handcuffs, and a jury trial, I'd have to think fast. I tugged Dylan's shirt sleeve and spoke as quietly as I could. Please let me handle this. Even though I whispered it under my breath, I knew Dylan heard because, shifter hearing, four pickled beets benefit, I slammed my hands on my hips and raised my voice. I'm his wife, Rudy Rudeness. You'd let your wife stand in line with you, wouldn't you? It wasn't a total lie, not exactly. We were mates, which according to Flynn was kind of the same thing. Dylan's eyebrows shot up. Pickled Beat rolled his eyes. Right, and I'm the Queen of Sheba. He moved his hands in an Egyptian dance. The nerve. I am. I was, kind of. It was just a matter of time before Dylan and I became Mr. and Mrs., the thought made my insides flutter like they were full of magical unicorns and glittery rainbows. Bullpucky, I don't see no ring. What was it with me and ass hats today? Well, I'm his soon to be wife, his fiance. Yeah, I'm his fiance. We're engaged. I nodded smugly. Prove it. Apparently, Dylan had only so much patience where letting me handle the situation was concerned. He turned and narrowed his eyes at Pickled Beat. The low growl again rumbled from his chest. To his credit, Rudy Rudeness did look intimidated, so he wasn't a total moron, but it didn't appear as though he'd back down, and it damn sure didn't look like Dylan would. I tugged on Dylan's sleeve again, and when he glanced at me, I jumped and grasped him around the neck. He was at least a foot taller, which was why I had to jump. I tried to tug his face closer to mine, but he didn't budge. He didn't seem to get what I was doing. Lean down, I hissed through my teeth. When he did, I planted my lips firmly against his. I may have been the initiator of the kiss, but as soon as our lips touched, Dylan immediately took charge. I expected kissing my mate to feel otherworldly. I expected to feel a heightened pleasure, but... Oh my god. The supercharged sizzle that gained momentum as it shot from my lips to my extremities tingled my everything. There was nothing slow or leisurely in his kiss. Dylan demanded, dominated, took what he wanted, and gave me what I wanted. One of his hands captured the back of my head and held me in place as he probed my mouth deeper. His tongue tangled with mine until I felt dizzy with desire. My muscles went limp. I heard myself moan. He tasted like rich caramel and something else, something raw and primal and male. Heat flared in my belly. An achy need throbbed between my thighs. All right, all right, you prove your point, you're engaged. Now knock it off or get a room. Rudy Rudeness was behind us scowling, but we no longer cared. We broke apart, each of us gasping for breath. If I'd had a single doubt before, I knew for sure after that kiss that Dylan King was my mate. Every nerve ending in my body knew it. Dylan was affected too, if the golden glow of his eyes was any indication. If not, then the hungry look in them sure was. Outside. Dylan's command vibrated through my body until I almost whimpered from it. I nodded once and let him take my hand and pull me to the exit. Chapter 6 Dylan It's going to rain. We'd no sooner stepped out of latte love when thunder crackled overhead, heeding her prediction. Ellen jumped. I pulled her closer, protectively or propertorily, I wasn't sure, both, probably both. From the moment I laid eyes on her, I'd been intoxicated, drunk on an elixir of arousal, potent and overwhelming. There was a niggling at the back of my mind that I couldn't quite get a grasp on, though. Something I needed to remember. Thunder rattled around us, lightning flashed across the sky. But I was lost to her, dumbstruck by her magnetism. Why did I feel as though I'd been waiting all my life for this moment, for this woman? I suspected that kiss was only the tip of a passion whose roots reached to the depths of my soul. I needed to kiss her again. 
needed, as in a powerful primal force. I want to. I didn't get a chance to finish the sentence. Another crack of thunder boomed, and the clouds opened up, unleashing raindrops so big they stung when they hit. Ellen gasped and burrowed against my chest. My place. It's two blocks. She didn't need to say another word. I grabbed her by the waist, hiked her up, and took off jogging down Main Street in the rain with her draped over my shoulder. As I ran, one word kept playing on repeat in my brain, one single thought. Mine. Every cell in my body yearned for more of her. She was the greatest, most surprising enigma. The niggling in the back of my skull grew fainter by the second, with her plump ass jiggling against my cheek and the tantalizing aroma of her arousal tickling my nostrils. I was as hard as steel and panting by the time I reached her cottage. The panting had nothing to do with exertion and everything to do with anticipation and desire. She was light as a feather to me. I could easily have run another ten miles for her without a trace of fatigue. I leaped onto the porch and placed her on her feet. She clung to me until her equilibrium leveled. How? How'd you know where I live? Turning, she attempted to open the door, but her fingers trembled so much she couldn't get it unlocked. I reached around and engulfed her hand with mine. Your scent. It smells like you. Even through the rain, I could smell it, like brownies and icing and sugary pastries. Together, we inserted the key, turned it, and pushed the door open. Instead of stepping inside, she froze on the threshold, blocking the entrance, her teeth nibbling her bottom lip. Oh, um, pay no attention to the mess. I had a burst water pipe and an absentee landlord. The interior of her cottage was a mess, true, and there was an underlying musty smell, but it was easily overpowered by the tantalizing aroma that was all Ellen. My hands were already around her hips, pulling her soft, sweet ass cheeks back against my needy erection. Blood was coursing through my body, pounding in my ears and making my thoughts a little hazy. I wanted her so bad I was losing control. I needed to slow down. Ellen looked over her shoulder at me and took a couple of steps inside. She seemed suddenly hesitant. Was she having second thoughts? I braced myself on her doorframe and blew out a rough breath. I needed to be sure. Should I leave? No! She swung around to face me full on. Her voice was breathy and rushed as though she was trying to get a grip on her own emotions. Please don't. I've waited so long for you, I don't want to wait another minute. She grasped my shirt with both hands, pulled me inside, and slammed the door shut. Then her expression became flustered. I mean, do you want to go? I'm not saying I want you to go, but do you want to? What do you want to do? Hell no, I don't want to go. I want to strip that Klingon uniform off you and explore every inch of your gorgeous curves. She inhaled sharply. Apparently, she'd forgotten how she was dressed. Reaching up, her fingers skimmed the rippled ridges on her forehead, and she smiled self-consciously. Not exactly an outfit made for seduction, is it? She was absolutely adorable. You're the most beautiful Klingon I've ever seen. I stepped forward and wrapped an arm around her, drawing her closer. Lifting her chin with a finger, I angled her face to mine. A breath away from her mouth, I hesitated, studying her sparkling blue eyes. So incredibly beautiful. Our mouths crashed together in a desperate kiss, her arms around my neck, mine around her waist. Our bodies molded to one another, our mouths savoring one another, our tongues tangling. The taste of her drove me wild. I couldn't get enough. My hands cupped her ass, lifting her. Her legs wrapped around my waist and I shuddered at the feel of her warmth against my throbbing erection. She pulled back from the kiss for only a second. Bedroom, to the right, down the hall. I barreled through the room like a madman. My leg hit something, it sounded like a plastic storage bin, as it crashed to the ground, but neither of us looked. 
A few other things fell to the floor before we made it to the bed and tumbled onto it. Our mouths remained locked in a kiss the whole time, desperate and frantic. This was all new to me. Lions didn't have this kind of lusty attraction. Our sex was strictly mechanical, a biological function. This was like nothing I'd ever experienced. The hunger, the desire, the passion. I didn't quite know how to handle it, but I knew I'd die if I wasn't inside her soon. She pushed away from me, sat up, and struggled to remove her Klingon uniform. I need to get out of this thing. Ellen unclasped the belt and wiggled as she reached behind her. Then she stood, kicked off her shoes, and muttered profanities as she danced around with one elbow pointed at the ceiling and the other at the floor. I can't get the zipper. Fighting a grin, I reach up and pulled the zipper down, watching as she wiggled the costume off her shoulders, over her hips, to her ankles, then kicked it across the room. She peeled the latex forehead and wig combo off and tossed that too. Her long, golden blonde hair tumbled out, framing her face. My breath hitched in my lungs. She was stunning. As she tried to unhook her bra and wiggle out of her panties, I impatiently pulled her down on the bed and helped. Her breasts tumbled out, full and creamy, begging for my mouth. I loved the breathy little gasps she made when my hands cupped them and I rolled my tongue over her pebbled nipples. When she tugged at my shirt, I quickly slipped it over my head. Her dimpled smile, cheeks tinged a rosy pink, was mesmerizing. Her gaze drifted to the bulge in my jeans, and I had those off in less than a second, rolling us so I was on top. Our lovemaking was heated and frantic. I kissed down her neck, sucking the skin just below her ear. She raked her nails down my back and arched into me when I settled between her thighs. Everything about her was perfect. Her taste, the smoothness of her skin, the softness of her curves. Her body was tight and hot, and I nearly came apart when I sank into her. Her walls squeezed me so tightly, the torture was exquisite. I moved slowly, giving her time to adjust to my girth, but Ellen impatiently raised her hips under me, urging me to pump harder, go deeper. As my thrusts gained force and momentum, I felt myself connecting with her in a way that was all new, a wondrous, spectacular, and enchanting connection. Bewitched by her spell, with her under me, around me, squeezing me, I would never be the same. I'd never felt so proud as when she buried her face in the crook of my neck and cried out my name. It was the most erotic and satisfying sound in the world. I felt like Superman. No, not Superman. Superman's God. A super Superman. I was the overlord of planet Earth. Krypton, too. Ellen clung to me as my orgasm followed hers. I had to turn my head to the side to avoid sinking my teeth into her and marking her. I never had to do that before, fight an urge to claim. I hadn't believed it existed or that I could feel these feelings. Ellen brought something inside me to life and I wanted to keep it, keep her, for a... My ecstasy was thwarted when a terrifying vision flashed through my consciousness. Sad eyes anguished, forlorn, unrequited love, a desolate grave, a farewell chiseled in cold stone. Reality crashed around me like a wrecking ball. She was my mate. My mate? It made no sense, yet it was the only thing that did make sense. My heart stopped beating in my chest, my stomach flipped. What the hell kind of a fucking sorry-ass bastard was I? What kind of an assholeish thing had I just done? I wanted to pummel myself. I rolled over and rubbed at my face, trying to make sense of what just happened. Fuck. I was stupid, careless. An hour ago, I'd been planning to start a pride and propose to Brittany and Ashley. Now? Now? If there was a way, any way at all. But there wasn't. I couldn't bring a human woman into my world. I knew better than anyone what the consequences of that would be. My selfishness would rob her of any hope of a future. 
The fucked up beast in me still wanted to do it. The rational man in me couldn't. There would be no coming back from that level of cruelty. I had to get out. I stood hastily, stepped into my jeans, and yanked them up my hips. Well, I probably won't see you around anytime soon, so uh, take care and uh, thanks. Take care and thanks. I cringed. I couldn't look at her. If I did, I wouldn't have the strength to walk out, and I had to, for her sake. She deserved so much better. What? You're serious? Her voice quivered, riddled with tears. You're leaving? The scent of her pain filled the room, slamming into me so hard it nearly brought me to my knees. I snatched my shirt off the floor, not bothering to put it on. Ellen shot off the bed and clutched my wrist in both hands. When I looked down to pry her fingers off, I caught sight of her eyes pooling with unshed tears. My chest felt like it was caving in. I should never have. I ran a hand through my hair. Her face was awash in a mixture of shock and pain. The soft, sweet mouth that had just been open in pleasure now hung open in horror. Go then, Ellen. She grabbed her latex Klingon forehead off the floor and threw it at me. Go! It hit me in the chest and dropped to my feet. I'm sorry. She held up a hand to silence me. Fuck you, Dylan King. She spun around, raced into the bathroom, and slammed the door. I wanted to follow, but I knew it would be the wrong move. My throat tightened, choked with an emotion that was new to me. I raced out the door and ran through the rain all the way back to my truck, parked outside Latte Love. I'd gone from Superman to arch-villain in minutes. I didn't know how or why any of this happened, but I knew one thing for sure. My plans of forming a pride were trashed. Chapter 7 Ellen I stepped under the hot water, ugly, crying as I soaped and lathered and scrubbed Dylan off me. I was trembling from anger, pain, and disappointment. Not disappointment, devastation. I scrubbed until my skin was red. Then I washed my hair three times to make sure it held no trace of his scent. I stayed under the hot water, scrubbing and crying for a long time. I probably would have stayed all night curled up in the bottom of the shower, trying to forget Dylan's harsh retreat if I hadn't run out of hot water. Growing up, I'd been a square peg in a world of round holes. Lots of kids had divorced parents, but I seemed to be the only one without a family. There was money. There was my mother, when it suited her schedule. There were countless stepdads. They came and went through a revolving door. There was stuff, a closet bursting with designer clothes, a driver, maids. But when I won the spelling bee in the fifth grade, mom was in Barbados with her fourth husband, Greg. Or maybe it was Byron, her fifth. When I fell off the monkey bars and broke my collarbone, mom was in Paris on one of her honeymoons. I swore that one day I would have a family a man who loved me, and a house full of children. As hard as I tried, it just hadn't happened. But Dylan was my mate, I was sure of it. And Shifters never abandoned a mate, ever. This didn't make any sense. That look in his eyes, though, clear regret. Leaving the bathroom, my gaze landed on the rumpled bedsheets. A lump rose in my throat. I yanked everything off, carried it into the other room, and shoved it all into trash bags. I didn't want to ever look at any of it again. I'd rather pretend none of this happened. After throwing on my spare set of sheets, I fell into bed and buried my face in my pillow, heartbroken. Any sliver of hope that my mate would bring the happy family of my dreams was shattered. Story of my life. A fresh batch of tears started and I cried myself to sleep. I looked rough the next morning, but as I left for work at Jammy Salon, I hardly cared. I'd been meticulous about my appearance for so long that I probably looked like a zombie walking in with red-rimmed eyes and no makeup. 
Layla was at her station, perusing the two-week schedule I'd made up before going home on Saturday. When she glanced up at me, her eyes went wide. She dropped the paper and came toward me. Are you okay? I rolled my lips between my teeth. I'm fine, she groaned. Sorry, I didn't mean to say it like that. You look different is all. It took me by surprise. Fern walked in, glanced at me, and her eyebrows rose. What's wrong, Ellen? I didn't answer. Instead, I busied myself doing the things I normally did in the morning. I started the coffee, rearranged last-minute schedule changes, and ran through the voicemails. Jammy and Kitty arrived together. Kitty looked at me, stopped, and did a double take. Feeling like an idiot, I stood up from my desk and put my hands on my hips. Just so we get this out of the way, I'm not bothering to dress up to impress a potential husband anymore. I don't want one. Also, I'm giving my two-week notice. Jamie dropped her bags and hurried over to me. Oh, Ellen, why? What's wrong? I almost broke down at the warmth and concern coming from her. Nothing, nothing's wrong. I just, I don't need this job anymore. I want to focus on my YouTube channel. Layla frowned. Okay, but what's got you down? The door opened again and Parker strolled in, Stella on her hip. Hey, all, what's going on? Kitty shrugged. Something's wrong with Ellen, and she's about to tell us what. Also, she's quitting. We'll miss you, honey. Well, what is it? Layla gestured for me to hurry up and spit it out. I told them everything about my interaction with Dylan. Well... Almost everything, right up to and including the humiliating way he ran away. I just don't get it. Everything was incredible, amazing, every single second. I straightened the bottles of bubble shampoos and conditioners on the display rack. Right up until the moment he took off running like a bat out of hell. Jamie clucked her tongue in disapproval. Kitty patted my shoulder as she walked by. That boy's a fool, I know that much. What had I done wrong? I played the scene over and over in my head until it sliced my insides like a straight razor. The most puzzling part is, we're mates. Parker stared at me with a frown that twisted her lips. What makes you think that? Heat scorched my cheeks. I patted my chest. I felt it. With Stella on her hip, she wrapped her arm around me and rested her head on my shoulder. I'm sorry, Ellen. I know you want a mate. I don't think it's Dylan, though. He wouldn't have reacted to you that way. I bit my lip and dabbed under my eyes with a Kleenex. He's my mate, Parker. Uh-huh. She nodded, but I could clearly tell she didn't believe me. Shame stained my cheeks, burning a path across my skin. Tears stung the backs of my eyes. I would not cry. No way. I gathered my emotions and plastered a firm smile on my face. No way would I break down at work in front of everyone. I don't understand why he just ran out like that. I felt our connection instantly. He did too, I know it. I gestured to my body. I'm likable. I looked up at them. Right? Layla sighed. Men are idiots sometimes. You deserve better. Blinking furiously, I stretched my smile even wider. Layla probably thought I didn't see it, but she clearly shot Parker a pointed look as their eyes met in the large wall mirror at Layla's station. Parker, who was bouncing Stella on her knee, sent an empathic stare back. Those two were exchanging an entire nonverbal convo while I was falling apart. Finally, Parker turned to me. Ellen, I'll talk to Dylan, make him explain. He should really apologize for being so rude to you. I sucked in a sharp breath. Don't you dare. As though I wasn't embarrassed and humiliated enough. October walked into the salon to hear the tail end of that. Dylan, are y'all talking about Dylan, king of the jungle? That man is a sexy beast. Wow. She clawed the air with her spiky black lacquered fingernails and motioned Parker out of her chair. I let out a huge groan and flopped my head down on the desk with a thunk. 
He's my mate. I know it. I mean, I'm his mate. Whatever. Apparently, my moping finally got to Parker. She shot up to announce her news to the whole salon. You know what? I've made up my mind. Ellen will be the first non-shifter to have a profile on Cybermates. Congratulations, Ellen. I'm going to find the perfect match for you. I deflated even more. No, thanks. Everyone froze, the entire room silent. They were staring at me like I was Medusa and had just turned them all to stone. Jaws hung open and eyes bugged out. What? I told you guys. Parker looked at me pityingly. I know, I know. You want a shifter and you think Dylan is your mate, but you need to stay away from lions. They're a different breed. So Dylan was a lion shifter. Wow. But what the hell did she mean, they're a different breed? I ground my teeth and stared up at the ceiling. Spotting a cobweb, I grabbed my broom and lifted it to try to brush it away. Parker moved with Stella over to Margie's vacant chair. You know, I've already made four successful matches, right? Just let me work my magic. Promise, you'll forget all about Dylan King. Parker thought that if she set me up on a date, I'd find someone else and forget all about my mate who didn't want anything to do with me. Not likely. As of last night, I'd sworn off all men, indefinitely. The thought hurt my heart, but not nearly as much as Dylan's rejection had. When I realized that Parker wasn't going to stop until I agreed, I did. I had no intention of actually dating. I just wanted to shut her up. Fine, whatever, do your thing, but no lions. I absolutely draw the line at lions. She swiped the air with her free hand, motioning the thought away. Oh, you don't need to worry about that. Lion shifters don't mate outside their species. What? My stomach sank to my toes. Or, I mean, well, oh, hell. It's true. Lion shifters stick to their own kind, and they're polygamous. Polygamous? That means that I know what it means. It had to be a mistake, though. Ugh, I was definitely swearing off men. From this moment forward, I would never go near a man again, and I wouldn't even look at a shifter. I closed my eyes as silent tears streamed down my cheeks. Chapter 8 Ellen Two months, one week, three days, and six hours later. Blinding sunshine, blistering heat, and sweltering humidity all topped off with a generous portion of lizards, mosquitoes, sand fleas, and fire ants. Late July in the Florida Keys was like taking an immersion tour through the bowels of hell with palm trees and Mai Tais. Seriously, the swelter was no joke. Mariah said the lock sometimes sticks. Arden jiggled the house key as she tried to blow a wayward strand of hair out of her face. The hair, already plastered to her forehead with sweat, didn't move. I fanned my face with my hand. Maybe there's some WD-40 in the shed? I'm about to pass out in this heat. Got it. When the stubborn tumblers finally gave way and we stumbled into the house I'd just rented, sight unseen from Mariah Starr, I almost wished the lock had remained stuck. We stood immobile on the threshold and stared, utterly and completely flabbergasted. Eventually, one of us gasped, not sure which one of us. Every visible surface was littered with trash. Empty beer cans, old pizza boxes, takeout containers, magazines, clothing, junk mail, and a myriad of other items of completely useless junk. There was a near-life-size poster of Pamela Anderson's circa her Baywatch days on the far wall. A seven-year-old buxom babe's calendar hung from a kitchen cupboard door, and something was draped over the lampshade. Was that a... Yeah, it was a jock strap. What is this place? Arden cleared her throat. It was Patton's old bachelor pad. 
She strolled around the room while my feet remained rooted to the sticky, God only knew what that orange stain was carpet. Mariah did say the guys used to use it as a party house, but holy cow, this place looks like a frat house during pledge week. I nodded in agreement. Wonder how many beer kegs ended their lives here. Arden swiped her finger along the fireplace mantle, then tried to shake off the thick thimble of dust. Eventually, she ended up just wiping it off on the back of the couch. From what Mariah told me, it's been vacant for quite some time, so I guess we should have expected. Are you sure you don't want to stay with Flynn and me? I know our place is small, but at least it's not a giant petri dish culturing new strains of bacteria. I laughed, or tried to. My attempt at a light-hearted laugh sounded more like a howler monkey and a bullfrog had a baby, a howl croak. I'm sure. I'd stayed with her and Flynn for the previous two nights and hadn't gotten a wink of sleep. Even noise-canceling headphones and relaxing nature sounds didn't block out the moans, groans, cries, and squeals of their lovemaking. Hashtag never again. It isn't all that bad. I'll get a team from Tidy Maids to do an emergency visit. Maybe order a trash dumpster or two or four. Hell, maybe a backhoe. I forced my legs to move and tried to shift my focus to the positive, something that hadn't come easily lately. Well, the open floor plan is nice, and look at this kitchen. Great lighting for my YouTube videos. I have a couple of new recipes waiting to be filmed for my channel. Arden nodded, then gestured to the sink. How long do you think those dishes have been piled in there? I grimaced, but before I could respond, she reached into her purse and pulled out her vibrating cell phone. I have to take this. She waved her cell phone in the air, grinning from ear to ear as she headed back toward the front door. I called after her, pointing to the ceiling. I'm taking a look upstairs. As I headed toward the stairs, a stack of photos on the edge of the dining room table caught my eye. I picked up the top one, brushing the dust off with a crumpled napkin, and stared at a bunch of guys laughing, drinking, and mugging for the camera. I recognized Jake and Patton right away, and another guy. Emerald, green eyes, dazzling smile, grinning like the demon of mischief and wearing a pair of lace panties on his head. Dylan. He looked younger, maybe eight or nine years, but he was just as handsome as ever, and my heart constricted like it was being squeezed in a vice. I absently rubbed my lower belly. It had been over two months since I'd last seen the more mature version of Dylan King. Two months since he'd swept into my life like a whirlwind. And back out just as quickly. If I saw him today, I'd run as far and as fast as possible. In fact, I'd rather gargle with dirty toilet water than have to set eyes on that man again. And the feelings were mutual. If the way he took off two months ago, never contacting me again, was any indication, right after the most amazingly hot, feverishly orgasmic, earth-shatteringly passionate experience of my 27-year existence. I groaned and tossed the picture back onto the pile. The man screwed me one minute and ran screaming the next. Okay, he didn't literally scream, but he sure didn't bother sticking around or care about what he left behind. Jackass. My anger flared as I marched upstairs and pushed open the door to the first bedroom. Before I could enter, I heard a noise coming from the room at the end of the hall. I had heard a noise, hadn't I? It had been faint. Maybe my imagination? Or maybe not. When I heard it again, I knew what it was. Raccoons. They often found their way into vacant homes on the island. They built nests, messed with heating and ventilation systems, and inflicted thousands of dollars worth of damage. As if the place wasn't enough of a wreck. Well, not today, varmints. I took two steps in the direction of the squatters before. I froze. What if it wasn't a nest of raccoons? What if it was a human, an intruder, lying in wait? 
The smart thing would have been to turn around and call the police, ask them to come and investigate. Then again, did I really want to be the crazy woman who got spooked by a family of trash pandas? No, I did not. I was highly hormonal and I was in no mood to be the butt of jokes down at the island precinct. I crept back to the bedroom and searched for anything I could use as a weapon. The best I could find was a badminton racket and a can of Lysol. Creeping closer to the closed door at the end of the hall, my pulse thundered like a jackhammer. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end. If an intruder was behind that door, this would not end well. For him. Just as I reached for the doorknob, the door swung open and, as if in slow motion, emerging from a vaporous cloud of shower fog, wearing nothing but a low-slung towel clutched at his waist, was Dylan. Wet hair, smoldering eyes, smelling like cedar and soap and maleness, six feet four inches of sculpted muscle and manly hotness. Damn, if my nipples didn't pucker like traitorous little hussies. And what was worse, I had no words. For over two months, I'd imagine what I would say to the man when I saw him again. I planned the entire exchange in my mind. I would say something witty and undeniably sophisticated. He would struggle for words and trip over his tongue as he begged my forgiveness. I would remain cool and passive, never letting him know he'd hurt me. He would drop to his knees and pledge his undying devotion. Instead, I stared open-mouthed, stunned, stupid. He looked equally surprised. Ellen, what are you? Whether it was a knee-jerk reaction, gut instinct, or a deep-seated need for revenge, I really couldn't say, but my finger depressed the trigger of the Lysol can aimed at his face at the same time my arm swung the badminton racket aimed at his head. Both hit their targets with bullseye precision. Fuck! His hands flew to his eyes as the towel fell to the floor. And there he stood before me in all his glory, Every delectable inch. Despite never wanting to lay eyes on him again, I was getting a mighty big eyeful now. Mighty big. I scooped up the towel and held it out to him, waving it around. Here, cover up. Your junk's flapping in the breeze, he huffed. Well, pardon me. It's difficult to see through the burning haze of disinfectant. Ooh, he sounded angry. Was he angry? He was probably angry. Are you angry? Am I? He narrowed his teary bloodshot eyes and stared for a moment. Then he rolled his head back on his neck and stared at the ceiling. He might have been counting to ten, not sure. He breathed a long sigh. No, I'm not angry, but what are you doing here? What am I doing here? What are you doing here? He snatched the towel from my hand and then said at the same time I did, I live here. Chapter 9. Dylan A motion at the top of the stairs drew my attention. Ellen, what's going- Oh, hello. Warn a girl next time, huh? Judging by the voice and blurred silhouette, Arden Richardson was at the end of the hall. I quickly wrapped the towel around my lower half and blinked, trying to clear the fog clouding my vision. Arden was my mechanic's mate. I'd sold my cherry red Mustang to Flynn shortly before his accident. Ellen held up her weapons to show Arden. I thought he was an intruder or a raccoon. She turned stiffly to me. Um, sorry if I blinded you. You didn't blind me. I'm a shifter. I'll heal in a few minutes. She crossed her arms over her chest. I rescind the apology then. I stifled a grin at her sass. I couldn't be too angry at Ellen, not after the pain I'd caused her. Hell, I deserved worse than a whack to the head and stinging eyes. The moment I opened the bathroom door and saw Ellen standing there, I thought I was dreaming that she was an apparition, an irresistibly beautiful apparition. Now, a blurry apparition, I didn't need to be reminded of how beautiful she was. The blurred vision was probably a blessing. I rubbed my aching eyes again. You said you live here. 
What did you mean when you said that? What did you mean when you said it? I meant I rented the house yesterday, paid patent for the month. Impossible. I gave Mariah first, last, and a security deposit yesterday. I looked up at the ceiling and huffed a humorless laugh. Fucking Patton. What's so funny? I shrugged. You rented the house from Mariah. I rented the house from Patton. Wait, you paid a security deposit? For this place? She palmed her forehead and shook her head. I hadn't seen the dump yet. Arden was nodding like a bobblehead and grinning from ear to ear. Maybe you two could just share. I mean, there's enough room. No, no way. Dylan's going to find somewhere else to rent. Ellen slammed her fists on her hips. I rubbed my jaw. Why would I move out? I was here first. Why don't you find another place? Arden shook her head. Well, I hate to burst both your bubbles, but this is peak tourist season in the Florida Keys. There are waiting lists for the waiting lists for availability on this island. Ellen groaned and her tone changed from I'll kill you in your sleep to I'll only maim you severely. Look, the cottage I've been renting suffered structural damage in the storm we had a few nights ago. This was the only thing I could find on short notice. Did she really think I wouldn't leave in a heartbeat if I had somewhere else to go? In the past, I'd stayed on Patton's boat when I was in the Keys, but that wasn't an option anymore. Not since he'd found his mate and settled down. He and Mariah split their time between the boat and her house, but they both carried the constant lingering smell of mating, which was too much for me to handle. I shrugged. I bought a house on the island and it's in the middle of renovations. It's not livable just yet. So, I guess Arden's right. We're both stuck here until something else becomes available. Ellen threw up her hands, then blew out a sharp breath. Fine. She waved the Lysol and the badminton racket in my face. But you keep your distance. Better yet, stay out of my sight entirely. Turning on her heel, she marched downstairs, taking the weapons with her. I shut the bedroom door and leaned against it. The two of us, under one roof, was not going to fly. I'd had a hard enough time the past two months struggling with my addiction to her. And addiction was the perfect word. I was addicted to her. The taste of her skin, the feel of her lips, the scent of her arousal, the memory of her little moaning breaths as she neared orgasm. I hadn't forgotten a single second. I never would. The thought alone had me fighting a growing erection. Even though my eyes and nose still burned from the Lysol, it felt so good to be near her. Way too good. I could not allow anything to develop between us. Fortunately, she hated me. Good. I needed her to hate me. That would ensure things didn't get out of hand, because Lord knew I couldn't trust myself so near her. I threw on clothes and listened to Arden and Ellen dragging in suitcases. Arden said something about having to leave for a weekly dinner with her family. I picked up my cell off the bedside table and called Patton. It went to voicemail. Then I called Jake. Again, I got voicemail. I left a message asking them to put a rush on the repairs that I would pay whatever it took to compensate the crew for overtime if I could get into my house faster. I didn't even mind living in the house while it was under construction as long as I had running water. Fucking Patton. Patton James put on a good act as carefree, laid back, and absent-minded, but we'd been close friends since grade school. Patton was no fool. He was a hell of a lot sharper than anyone gave him credit for, and I wouldn't be surprised if he planned this entire thing. I'd managed to keep my distance from Ellen for months. I didn't need her perky tits and bow-shaped lips in my face all day. I spent the next five hours at a corner table at Mimi's with earbuds in my laptop. I drank, I ate, I worked. When I returned, the house was quiet. It was disgusting, too. It smelled like weak old gym socks coated in rancid cheddar and looked like a tornado ran through a war zone. On a positive note, the fact that I could smell it meant my sinuses were finally clearing up from the disinfectant assault. I'd start cleaning in the morning. I stuck my leftovers from Mimi's in the fridge and went upstairs. 
I stripped, tossed my clothes in a pile, and threw myself across the bed on top of the blanket, watching the ceiling fan slowly twirl overhead. It took great effort to ignore the fact that Ellen was under the same roof and down the hall, only a few doors away. I'd only gotten a glimpse of her before she sprayed me, but it didn't matter. I had her memorized. As I rolled over, her curves played with my mind. The fullness of her ass, the swells of her breasts, and the curve of her lips. I pictured her looking up at me, heavy-lidded, pupils dilated, her head thrown back in ecstasy as she straddled me, moaning my name. Then... I pictured her raking her fingernails down my back as she writhed beneath me. With a groan, I got out of bed and headed to the shower. Standing under the ice-cold spray, I braced myself with my forehead against the shower wall and let the water roll down my body. The shower did little to help. Guilt weighed heavily on me as I tried again to get comfortable back in bed again. I knew I'd done the best thing for Ellen by walking away two months ago, but I also knew I caused her pain. Staring at the ceiling was not helping to get my mind off the situation, so I pulled on some shorts and headed downstairs to start cleaning. I had a load of cleaning supplies in my truck, industrial trash bags, all-purpose household cleanser, a carpet scrubber, and with added elbow grease, spent the rest of the night cleaning and hauling out trash. Every time I stopped for even just a minute, my thoughts landed right back on Ellen, upstairs, in the first bedroom, on the right, my addiction. Chapter 10, Ellen. I spent the first half hour of the morning worshiping the porcelain god. How was it I could continue heaving when there was nothing in my stomach? Once my inside stopped playing tilt-a-whirl, I washed my face, brushed my teeth, piled my hair into a messy bun, and went downstairs. The first floor was unrecognizable. It was like I'd entered a different house in an alternate universe. The dining room table was clear, the furniture was clutter and trash-free, Pamela Anderson and Buxom Babes were gone. Every surface was spick and span. Even the carpet was clean, and apart from a couple of faint stains, didn't look too bad. Had Dylan spent all night cleaning? He must have. It was either that or an army of little elves visited while we slept. It smelled a heck of a lot better, too, which was good because I didn't think my stomach could handle eau de Limburger and locker room this morning. Dylan was in the kitchen with his back to me. Crap. I was hoping he'd already be gone. I knew I'd have to have a serious sit down with him eventually, but I wanted a little more time to come to terms with things myself first, to formulate some appropriate boundaries. Maybe I could just sneak back upstairs for a while. I had videos to film and I needed the kitchen for that, but I supposed I could do it later or take a day or two off until we worked out a schedule that was mutually suitable. I turned around to quietly creep back up the steps, when Dylan swung around so fast I swear I heard a whirring sound. I froze, then looked over my shoulder. His nose scrunched up and he sniffed the air. His eyes shot to my stomach, narrowed to slits, and he sniffed again. Then his eyebrows arched in surprise. Double crap. I forgot about the shifter's sense of smell, Layla could scent out chocolate from a block away. This was not how I wanted to do this. He opened his mouth to say something, then he closed it again, then opened it again to speak, but nothing came out. With stumbling steps, he marched across the room to stand in front of me. I flinched. We stood for several seconds of strained silence. Dylan's eyes yo-yoed from my face to my stomach while my mind searched for the appropriate words to say. All the color had drained from his face. Finally, he opened his mouth again, but before he could say anything, another wave of nausea hit, and I ran to the bathroom, hunched over and clutching my stomach for round two of porcelain devotion. I stayed in the bathroom, like cowardly chicken poo, for about fifteen extra minutes, 
until I could no longer make excuses to myself. Then I emerged slowly, preparing, as well as one could prepare, for the firestorm that undoubtedly awaited. Dylan wasn't outside the bathroom door, ready to tear into me like I feared, but just as I reached the bottom step, his command rang out from the direction of the kitchen. Sit. It wasn't as though I was suddenly taking orders from him, but I was weak and shaky and a little nervous about being thrust into a conversation I was unprepared for. I perched on one of the dining room chairs and stared down at the scarred wood table with what I hoped looked like a cool mask of indifference. Dylan slid a plate of dry toast and a cup of tea in front of me. Eat. Another order? My stomach was too queasy to argue that he had no right to boss me around. I picked up a piece of toast to busy my hands and took a bite. The silence lingered. I chewed toast. It went on for so long, I finally glanced up. Our eyes met. His expression softened. Don't cry, Ellen. Do not cry. He used his chin to gesture to my stomach. Do I need to ask who the father is? I cleared my throat of nervousness and toast crumbs. I think you know. When were you planning to tell me? He was angry. That was anger in his voice, definite anger. He looked downright frightening when he was angry, every bit the jungle beast. Or were you going to tell me? You weren't planning to keep it a secret indefinitely, were you? Now that just pissed me off. He had no right to judge. I speared him with a vicious glare. If my eyes were Starfleet-issued phasers right now, I would have sliced him in two, or vaporized him. Of course I was going to tell you. I welcomed the anger. It chased away the threat of tears. The last thing I wanted to do was cry in front of him, but hormones were calling the shots these days. If you hadn't ghosted me, you'd have known sooner. He had the decency to look ashamed, but he was clearly still angry with me. I wasn't all too happy with him either. Seriously, what did you expect? It's not as though you gave me your number and asked me to call or anything. I added a casual shoulder shrug because I wanted to defuse the situation, not escalate it. The whole thing was really not going the way I imagined. Somehow, in my mind, when we had this conversation, I was a lot more confident and put together, not nauseated and cranky and all affected by how hot and sexy he was standing a couple of yards away. Who wouldn't be affected by him? Even first thing in the morning, he looked like he could be one of the Chippendale dancers, whereas I had bedhead and vomit breath. I had to remember that he'd probably still be ghosting me if not for the major screw-up by Patton and Mariah. As far as I was concerned, that was concrete proof about how he felt. Dylan didn't want, nor had he ever wanted, anything to do with me. Nothing other than a quick hookup. If he thought I would behave like my mom in a situation like this and throw myself at him, he had another thing coming. Thanks for the toast, but I'm not up for conversation this morning. I have a lot of baking to do and videos to film for my YouTube channel. Maybe we can postpone this conversation until later. I had no intention of having a conversation later. I planned to avoid him later. I think he knew that, too, if his intense scowl was any indication. Time to make myself scarce. I stood and headed out of the room. He was in front of me in a flash, I didn't know a person could move that fast. Ah, but he was no ordinary person, was he? You're carrying my baby. I released a sigh. Look, I haven't had much time to process this myself. I was going to tell you once I'd fully digested it. But one thing I can say for sure is that I love this baby with everything in me and I will protect this little nugget with my life. True, single motherhood was not what I'd envisioned when I dreamed of a family. But life threw curveballs and you either ducked and dodged or you swung and hoped you didn't strike out. I intended to hit motherhood out of the park. You're carrying my baby, he repeated. 
I sighed. The last thing I wanted was to alienate Dylan from Nugget's life. I knew from experience how it felt to grow up without a dad, with one who wished I never existed. A child deserved better. But I wasn't my mom either. No way would I sink my fangs into a man who clearly didn't want me. If you want to be an involved parent, great, fine, dandy, as long as you realize that you and I are nothing. If you don't want to be involved, that's fine too. Either way, I'm doing this, alone. But you're not alone. I'm always alone. I brushed him aside and headed upstairs. When I reached the top landing, I glanced down. Dylan was still standing in the same spot, his jaw hanging open. He looked mind blown. Chapter 11 Dylan I was mind blown. A baby? Holy fuck. My brain was ready to explode. What should I do? How should I handle this? All this time, I'd worked at keeping my distance from Ellen, with considerable difficulty, I might add. I'd done it for her sake, but now, my resolve just did a 180. A baby. There was a war of emotions going on in my head. Joy, pride, fear, panic. I was going to be a father. For the past two months, I had secretly stalked Ellen. I had to. My lion wouldn't rest unless we were near her and I knew she was safe. I followed her, keeping out of sight during the day, and at night, I sat outside her cottage for hours, watching over her. The drive back and forth to Miami got to be too much, so, eventually, I just bought a place of my own here on the island to be nearer to her. I knew she quit working at Jammies, and I knew her brand was taking off, because I followed her social media, YouTube channel, and blog. A baby. All this time, watching, following, and it never occurred to me. I was never near enough to scent her like I did this morning. I could see it now. Ellen's curves were more pronounced. She was plumper, and all the right places. Her breasts had swelled and now strained against her clothing. A baby. I'd run from her to protect her from the devastation that a human woman with a lion shifter mate experienced. I wouldn't let her be destroyed like that. Not Ellen. I'd die before I allowed that to happen to her. But leaving her alone was no longer an option. I had to figure out what came next. A baby. I headed to Miami for a scheduled meeting, my mind whirling and thoughts flying a mile a minute. When I returned to the island, the sun was already setting. I stopped to check on the construction at my place. I'd managed to all but steal a property right on the beach. The big house was the northernmost home on the island and had been foreclosed on. I'd snagged it the day it was put on the market. There were already multiple offers, but my offer of all cash had sweetened the pot for the bank. I'd almost ignored the listing after seeing it was on Lover's Lane, because that was too cheesy, but the house was too good to pass up. I'd gotten it for pennies on the dollar. It needed a little work to get it in shape, but I knew James Construction was the best in the state. I didn't see Patton's or Jake's trucks when I pulled up, and when I sniffed the air, their scent was faint. They were gone for the day. I sat on my front porch, unable to get the image of Ellen, the way she looked this morning, out of my head, bare-faced with a fresh, wholesome glow. There was a sweetness to her that made my chest ache. I'd hurt her majorly. I wasn't sure what to do to make it better, or even if I could. I still wasn't convinced of my ability to be a decent mate. How was I supposed to figure out how to be a decent mate when I'd never seen it done? Judging by the way I'd handled things so far, I was piss poor at it. There was no denying Ellen and I were mates. But what if I was like my father? A shudder ran through me. Swearing, I stood up and hurried to the side of the house. I stripped quickly and shifted, then sniffed the air hunting for Patton's scent. When I found it, I headed in his direction. The asshole was the closest thing I'd ever had to a brother, and I needed to talk about how big of a dick I'd been. 
It was best to talk about it with someone else first and get my thoughts clear before talking to Ellen, who didn't want to talk to me anyway. I ended up sneaking into the marina, still in lion form. That was risky, but few people were around at this time of the evening. I leaped aboard Castaway. After I released a soft growl, Patton came stumbling up from below deck in nothing but a pair of flip-flops and his birthday suit. I shifted back and frowned. Jesus, fuck, Patton, why are you naked? Right back at ya. What the fuck are you doing out here? He looked up at the moon and rubbed his eyes. What time is it? I need to talk to you about something. Oh, God. He moved over to his beach chair and sank into it. Kicking the other one, he nodded for me to sit. Well, I sank into it. I fucked up. So, it happens. No, not like a little fuck up. A big fuck up. He leaned forward. Did you murder someone? What? Really? You think I'm a murderer? He shrugged. I don't know. Ellen is my mate. He stared at me and didn't appear surprised at all. He just nodded. I figured as much. I cocked a brow. So that mix-up with you and Mariah both renting the place was a setup? He held his hands up. I plead the fifth. I knew it. I frowned. I was an asshole to her. Yeah, you were. You pretty much rejected her. It's worse. He leaned his chair back. What did you do? Well, in my defense, I didn't know. I just found out. Found out what? I sighed. She's pregnant. With my cub. Are you fucking kidding me? He growled. I should throw your ass overboard. Do it. Maybe it would make me feel slightly better. No, you'd like that, you twisted bastard. What happened? Scowling, I stood up and paced in front of him, giving him the rundown. You just ran scared before you gave it a chance. He rolled his eyes. You're going to get your ass handed to you for that. I deserved it. I still, I, I don't know, man. It's terrifying. I've never known a lion to have a mate. We're not supposed to have mates. First you said she was your mate, now you're wishy-washy. Are you seriously questioning it? No, no, I know she is. I just don't know how to wrap my mind around the concept of a mate. He shook his head and stood up. Then you're just an idiot. I'm going back to bed. Stop fucking around. I rubbed my hands down my face and blew out a big breath. I need advice. What the fuck do I do? Fix it. Great, wonderful, thanks, Ann Landers, for your expert advice. I shifted, made my way back to my clothes, dressed, and sat on my porch for a while longer. There was a time when I knew my future would contain a pride full of wives and children. That was B.E., before Ellen. A.E., after Ellen, my official rejection of any and all lionesses had spread quickly, courtesy of Brittany. Not in a bad way. Brittany and I had parted amicably. She never gave a shit about me. She just wanted to be the first wife of a wealthy, well-connected lion shifter. From what I'd heard, she already became wife number one to Tom Morris. Over the past two months, when I wasn't stalking Ellen, I'd been working like a madman, taking every job I could squeeze into my schedule in an attempt to keep my mind off her. It hadn't worked. I'd been plagued by thoughts of her from the time I opened my eyes in the morning until I fell asleep from exhaustion at night. The magnetism between us was just as intense today as it had been the first time I set eyes on her. Passion simmered just beneath the surface, even when she was angry enough to blind me with disinfectant. I didn't know how to make amends. Would she ever believe that staying away had been agony for me, but had been the only way I knew to protect her from my world? I didn't know how I gathered enough strength to walk away that night, but a hundred times or more in the last two months, I'd wanted to run back to her and beg her to forgive me. Fix it. Thanks, Patton. I wasn't sure I could fix it. 
I wanted our baby as much as I wanted Ellen, and I'd never let her go through a pregnancy alone. I knew she wouldn't make it easy to get close to her, and for that I didn't blame her. I just have to work extra hard to protect and care for her, for them. Because I was going to be in their lives, both of them. A smile unfolded across my face. A baby. Chapter 12, Ellen The only reason I stopped at Man's Grocery so late at night was that I needed a few items for the private cooking lesson I'd scheduled in the morning. One-on-one -on -one lessons were another one of my business ideas to help build my brand and make some extra cash on the side. I had a new client who wanted to surprise her husband by baking him a birthday cake from scratch. Fortunately, I'd been able to avoid Dylan for the past day and a half. We would need to talk eventually, but I hoped we could wait a few weeks. Barbie Mann was working the register when I walked in. I waved and headed toward the dairy aisle. Running through the checklist in my head, I grabbed butter and then heavy cream, tucked them both in the crook of my elbow, and headed to the baking aisle. I wasn't paying attention and nearly plowed down another customer as I emerged from the aisle. Jumping out of the way, I stumbled and almost fell. I would have fallen if a pair of strong arms hadn't caught me before I hit the ground. Whoa there, NASCAR. Save your speed for the track. The air left my lungs when I realized, the man staring down at me whose strong arms were wrapped around me and whose grin was melting my panties was Dylan. Dylan, 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 did the universe hate me? While I was busy cursing the universe, he righted me and made sure I was again steady on my feet. His arms remained around me. He was still touching me. He was just as drop-dead gorgeous as the last time I'd seen him, and my body reacted instantly. Annoyed, I wriggled away. He took a step back, his megawatt grin unwavering. Funny meeting you here. I was so shocked that instead of responding, I silently stepped around him and walked away. I instantly regretted the snub. We needed to get along if we were going to co-parent in the future, but the ache in my chest was painful. I continued down the next aisle, determined to play it cool. Chocolate chips, a new jar of cocoa, and a five-pound bag of sugar later, I had everything I needed for the cake. I headed to the produce section to pick up some healthy food for myself. As luck would have it, bad luck, Dylan was standing in front of the display of salads, exactly where I was headed. I shifted the things in my arms awkwardly and held in a sigh. Don't be a dick, Ellen. Holding my head high, I strolled over and stopped next to him. I promise I'm not following you, I just need a salad. I wouldn't mind if you were. I felt his eyes on me as I leaned forward to grab one of the prepackaged salads. Balancing while leaning forward and holding an arm load of groceries wasn't the easiest thing. I managed to scoop up a Caesar salad without falling over, but dropped the butter and the carton of cream in the kohlrabi display. Dylan snatched up both items before I did. You should have gotten a cart. His velvety voice gave me tingles. Let me hold some more of that. I looked down at the things clutched in my arms and shrugged. I didn't think I'd need one. I mean, I don't need one. I balanced the salad on top of the other things and snatched my butter and cream from his hand. And I don't need help. Can't I help anyway? I'd rather you didn't. I forced a brittle smile, hoping he'd take the hint and leave me alone. It seemed to work. He nodded stiffly. Well, maybe I'll see you back at the house later. If not, sweet dreams. His eyes were hooded when they met mine, and what I saw in them stunned me. I spun on my heel and ran for the checkout without looking back. I dropped everything on the conveyor belt and shook out my arms. Barbie was her usual talkative self, but I barely listened to her. I wanted to get out of there and get home before Dylan finished his shopping. While I knew I needed to make an effort to get along, it was hard to just forget that he'd treated me like a leper for the past two months. I wasn't ready to make nice with him yet. 
The only reason he was even speaking to me was that I was pregnant. Yes, I'd have to control my anger and have a rational conversation with him eventually, but not today. I gathered my shopping bags and quickly left the store, confused by what I'd seen in his eyes. Caring, concern, desire. Alan! I turned when I heard the male voice behind me. Hi, Mac. Mac was a shifter, a firefighter with the sun-kissed key fire department, and hands down, one of the handsomest men on the island. We met when Parker tricked us both into a blind date. If not for Dylan, I would have thrown myself at Mac. As it turned out, neither of us was interested in dating, but Mac was sweet and funny, and we became insta-friends. Parker had gotten something right, at least. He held out his hands for my grocery bags. Hand them over. Please don't make me walk empty-handed next to a woman carrying groceries. That would be a huge blow to my He-Man ego. I laughed and let him take my bags. He slowed his steps to match mine. Give it to me straight. What's going on with you? Last time we talked, you and your mate were having difficulties. He sniffed the air and raised his brows. Congratulations! I take it things have worked themselves out. No, actually, it's even worse than before. I couldn't find the words to tell Mac that it turned out the shifter I'd thought was my mate really wasn't, and I was pregnant with his baby. Mac frowned sympathetically. He's got to be a special kind of stupid if he isn't on his knees trying to make things right with a woman like you. I groaned. I don't want to talk about it. We walked a few minutes and I slipped into a broody silence. Hey, did I ever tell you about the time I took a weekend trip to Vegas with the guys and ended up married to my best friend Dan? No, tell me that's not a true story. He laughed. It's true, sadly enough. I giggled and buried my face in my hands. Is Dan gay? Neither of us is gay. We just figured that when you're in Vegas, you gotta check out Vegas wedding chapels. Stupidly, we waited until we were hammered to do it. I barked a laugh, picturing Mac waking up and realizing he'd married his best buddy. Mac shrugged. Neither of us has found mates, and he's a decent enough guy. That's hilarious. Fastest annulment in the state of Nevada, but we have a good story to tell at parties. Before I knew it, we'd arrived back at the place I was renting. Leave it to Mac to take my mind off my worries. He'd be a great mate to some lucky woman. Thanks for walking me, Mac, and thanks for the laugh. I needed that. He gave me a hug before saying goodbye. It was then that a deafening roar bellowed through the night. It was so loud it shook the earth, and Mac was suddenly flying backward as Dylan tackled him to the ground. Oh, crap. Chapter 13, Dylan I roared, charged, and tackled the shit stain to the ground, throwing a hard jab to his side, then to his face. I wanted to shift and fight him, beast to beast, but despite my blind rage at seeing him touch my mate, I had sense enough to know we were too out in the open to shift. He grunted from the blow, then did a quick roll, getting out from under me and hopping to his feet. Blood dripped from his split lip, his eyes flashed a glowing silver. Wolf shifter. I scented you coming, but you were faster than I thought. In response, I swung my fist, connecting with the side of his jaw. The blow stunned him, but he shook it off and came at me. I heard Ellen screaming, shouting for us to stop, but I couldn't. The dickhead put his hands on her, on my mate. He needed to be taught a lesson, and I intended to teach it, me and the business end of my fist. The asshole gave as good as he got, landing punch after punch as I did the same. Look, I don't want to do this with you, man. I was just giving the lady a hand. Giving her a hand? He touched her. They fucking hugged. Without restraint, I threw another right hook, followed by an immediate gut punch. The asshole kept trying to talk. If there was anything between Ellen and me, I promise you I would fight you full on, because that woman is worth fighting for. I had him by the front of his shirt. I'd lifted him off the ground when Ellen appeared at my side, clutching my arm with both hands, pulling it with all her might. 
Stop! Oh my God, Dylan, what the hell are you doing? It was then that I realized two things. One, the asshole and I were pretty evenly matched, and two, despite our matched abilities, he wasn't trying very hard to fight back. In fact, he didn't seem to be doing anything but the minimum to defend himself. I reluctantly dropped him and turned to her. She scowled at me but looked consolingly at him. I am so sorry, Mac. The asshole, Mac, wiped his bloody nose on his shirt. Don't be. It's what I wanted to see. Wolves have the best sense of smell of all shifters. I knew he was watching when I hugged you. I did it purposely. I wanted to see if he'd attack. Ellen seemed taken aback. What? Mac shrugged and grinned. His teeth were stained red with his blood. He wouldn't be much of a mate if he didn't. I wanted to make sure he was worthy of you. Now that I know how he feels about you, I can rest easy. He'll take care of you. Slimy, handsy bastard. Okay, he did kind of help me out by doing that and making a point to Ellen, but why the hell did he have to touch her to do it? Mac held up his hands in surrender as he addressed me. I promise you, I'm no threat, and in the future, I'll show more respect. I hissed and watched as he turned and walked off. Ellen didn't stick around. She marched inside in a huff, mumbling to herself. I wanted to follow her in, but my lion wouldn't allow it. I remained outside until I was sure Mac was really gone. By the time I calmed down enough to go in, the house was quiet and Ellen was already in her bedroom. I stretched out on my own bed, staring up at the ceiling fan. It had been a hell of a day, but I knew three things for sure. One, call it divine destiny, serendipity, or fate, but Ellen was definitely my mate. Two, it wouldn't be easy, but I'd do whatever I had to do for as long as I had to do it to make amends and win her over. And three, once I did win her over, I was never letting her go. Two days later, I stood leaning against the doorway watching her. She was working at the bar top counter that separated the kitchen from the rest of the open floor plan. She wore headphones and was singing The Lion Sleeps Tonight, off key, at the top of her lungs. A wee a wum away. I chuckled. Flour was sprinkled on the counter in front of her and it looked like she was kneading bread dough. I didn't want to upset her. She appeared relaxed like she was enjoying herself. But at the same time, I knew that if things were going to proceed between us, I would have to be the one to make it happen. Push it to happen. A few strands of her golden hair had escaped her messy bun, and a smudge of flour was on her nose. She picked up the ball of dough and slapped it forcefully back down on the counter. Then she stopped to roll her shoulders and gyrate her hips to the music. She looked up. Our gazes collided, and she froze like a deer in headlights. Her heart rate picked up, easily detectable to my shifter hearing. Her eyes blinked rapidly, then she looked down at her workspace and began punching the dough with renewed vigor. I huffed a laugh. She was imagining the dough was my face, no doubt. I came up behind her and gently stroked her upper arms to get her attention. She jumped and spun in one move, slapping my chest and leaving a flower handprint on my black t-shirt. What the hell are you doing? I pursed my lips together, trying not to grin. Getting your attention. What are you doing? She swallowed and gave me a sideways glance. I'm testing a new recipe for my blog. It's what I always do to ease stress. How much? How much what? Don't you offer private instruction? How much do you charge for private cooking lessons? You want to learn to bake? She sounded skeptical. I nodded. Desperately. How much? She rolled her eyes. You can't afford me. Try me. She continued to work. A hundred an hour. I removed my wallet and tossed two hundred dollar bills on the counter. There, now that that's out of the way, let's get to baking bread. She blinked a few times, looked down at the money, back at me, and down at the money again. She rubbed a hand across the back of her neck, seemingly unaware it left a trail of flour. Why are you doing this? 
I stared into her eyes. Look, if you really don't want to, I'm not going to harass you, but we need to talk. I thought it might be better if, when we did, you had something other than my face to punch. She drew in a huge breath and let it out slowly as she considered it. Okay, go wash your hands. Chapter 14, Ellen I'd been a little ashamed of the way I treated Dylan in the grocery store the other day. A little. Then, when he went all Neanderthal on Mac, I was livid. Until Mac admitted to intentionally instigating a fight to provoke a typical mate response. Now I was confused. By attacking Mac for hugging me, Dylan had behaved the way shifters were supposed to behave in regard to their mate. But we weren't mates. The passion between us had been so intense when we met that I'd been tricked into thinking we were until Parker set me straight. It hurt like hell to hear, but she explained the truth about lion shifters. Regardless, Dylan was right about us needing to open some lines of communication for Nugget's sake. I slipped the loaves of bread I'd been working on in the oven and set the timer so I could start a new batch with Dylan. Then I spent a moment gathering my thoughts before starting the conversation. Okay, let's talk about Nugget. I began preparing the workspace while he washed his hands in the kitchen sink. Nugget? Nugget? I pointed to my abdomen. If you want to be in Nugget's life, great. You and I will remain civil, respect each other's privacy, and keep our interactions strictly centered on our child. I think together we can work out an acceptable visitation schedule. Okay with you? In the blink of an eye, he was across the kitchen and at my side, shaking his head. No, not okay. I was flooded with disappointment. I had hoped he would love and want our baby as much as I did. Apparently, that wasn't the case. My heart lodged in my throat, and I struggled to fight back tears. I tried to sound unaffected. That's fine, too. I'll handle all parenting responsibilities and ask you for nothing. That's not okay, either. I turned to him, scowling. He shrugged. What if I want more? What did he mean, more? Was he going to fight me for custody? According to Mariah, Dylan had made millions from the sale of his tech company. He didn't flinch just now when I quoted him a ridiculous $100 an hour for a private baking lesson. He could hire a team of top-notch lawyers while I'd be stuck trying to find an ambulance chaser I could afford on the minuscule pay I earned from my fledgling business ventures. Anxiety nearly choked me, and I fought to keep from acting as freaked out as I felt. What do you mean, more? I want Nugget's mom, too. My eyes widened. I had no idea what to do with that, so I handed him a yeast packet and gestured to the bowl of warm water. Sprinkle this over the water, then add a teaspoon of sugar. He tore open the packet, his eyes flicking back to me as he worked. There's no question I want to be there for our baby in every way, but I want to be a part of your life, too. My heart was racing. I didn't trust him. I had good reason not to. How long would it be before he disappeared on Nugget and me the way my father had done with my mother and me? I cleared my throat. Yeast can be touchy. The trick is to make sure the water is not too hot. Don't go higher than about 110 degrees Fahrenheit. We're waiting until we see bubbles. That's how we know the yeast is activated. I've handled this all wrong. You deserved better. I'd like to have a chance to be better. Dylan kept glancing over at me, but I wasn't sure how to respond. All right, now we'll slowly pour the dry ingredients, the flour mixture, into the yeast and water. He wanted to be part of my life? In what capacity? This was not what I expected, not at all. Keep stirring until a ball of soft dough forms. What do you mean by a part of my life? He shrugged. How about we start with getting to know more about each other? Where we're from, likes, dislikes, all that. Must we? We're going to be parents. Right, good point. I sprinkled flour over our work surface. Go ahead and turn your dough out onto a floured surface, then knead it until it's smooth and elastic. He followed my instructions but didn't let up. 
Where are you from? Miami. Me too. I watched his strong fingers as they worked the dough. What was it that made Dylan kneading dough make me feel like I was watching soft porn? I know. I know a little about you. He turned and fixed me with a searching gaze. Such as? This was a terrible idea. It was hell being that close to him, and I didn't know what to do with all the emotions rolling around inside me while he was a mere foot and a half away, smelling like rich, creamy caramel. Um, I know you're quite the ladies' man. In fact, you charm the panties right off them, he coughed. I think you have the wrong impression of me. And wear them as a hat, he groaned. You saw that picture, huh? His lips contorted in a sheepish grin, and he shook his head. That was a long time ago. We were kids playing around. From the corner of my eye, I studied Dylan's perfectly symmetrical face. He was flawless, beautiful in a masculine sort of way. It really wasn't fair for one man to look so good. My pulse kicked into overdrive. You three are pretty close, you, Patton, and Jake. They're like brothers to me. We grew up together. The James family was my refuge. My own family, well, it was uh, different. I heard lion shifters are polygamous. That must have been strange, he nodded. My mom and I lived alone, away from the rest of the pride. She was half human and grew up with humans. Where is she now? She died. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't know that. I must have been studying him openly because I watched him turn to face me and his lips curl slowly at the corners. Once again, that dazzling smile of his dampened my panties. We stood staring at each other for a breathtaking minute. Then his heated gaze slid leisurely down my body. My nipples puckered, my tummy fluttered, my vagina clenched. Oh, this is bad. This is very, very bad. The electrical storm that danced in the air all around us was leading to nowhere good, and I had to do something to stop it. I crossed my arms over my chest and narrowed my eyes. How many wives do you have? He inhaled sharply. He looked surprised by the question, appalled, actually. None. I shot him a smug look. Why not? He scowled. Why not what? The buzz of the oven timer drew my attention, and I went to retrieve the bread from the oven, grateful to have an excuse to put more physical space between us. I wasn't, however, feeling gracious enough to discontinue my line of questioning and let him off the hook. Why don't you have any wives? Chapter 15 Dylan her expression was challenging, but I was up for the challenge. She bent to take the bread loaves from the oven, and I waited until she glanced over, looking me square in the eye. Because I was waiting for you. Ouch! Oh, shit, shit, shit! She clutched her hand to her chest and danced around the kitchen. It only took a second for the scent to register. Her usual sweet aroma of iced brownies and sugary pastries was shadowed by the pungent bitterness of pain and the acridity of burned flesh. She hurt herself. I ran to her side. Here, let me take a look at it. It's not a big deal. I wasn't paying attention and burned myself on the oven rack. So stupid. I turned off the oven and scooped her into my arms. We're going to a doctor. What? That's crazy. I just need some burn cream and a, a doctor. You need a doctor. I'm taking you to the emergency room. Don't be silly. That's overkill. It's just a burn. She rolled her eyes and grumbled, but let me carry her outside to my truck. Opening the passenger door, I placed her inside gently before sliding behind the wheel. I glanced over at her as I drove. She seemed to be deep in thought as she chewed her bottom lip. What is it, Ellen? You look like you have something on your mind. What happened that day we met? I mean, after, you know, when you ran, why did you suddenly not like me? My stomach clenched at the question and the clear anguish I'd caused her. It wasn't like that. I didn't. Shit. Ellen, I never disliked you. Just the opposite. I felt too much. 
I didn't know how to handle it. Fuck. How do I explain? So, I groaned. I wasn't sure where to begin or how to find the words. Let's get you to the doctor first, then I'll explain, I promise. Actually, I only need to know one thing. Would you be asking for a chance to be a part of my life right now, if I weren't pregnant? Well, probably not, but that's what I thought. She crossed her arms over her chest. That's all I need to know. It's not like that. I mean, it's not what you're thinking. We really have nothing else to discuss right now? Anything else can wait? Her teeth clenched and her nostrils flared. She turned to stare out the window. I felt like a huge jerk. I didn't know how to do this whole mate thing. I'd screwed it up already and it didn't seem that I was getting any better at it. There was a very good chance she'd never understand or accept my explanation and that she wouldn't give me a second chance. If that happened, I would spend the rest of my life stalking her, following in the shadows, watching over her from a distance to ensure she was safe. I took Ellen to Sunkist Key Medical Center's emergency room, where she was given burn cream and a Band-Aid. She kept shooting me I-told-you-so looks, but I didn't care. As far as I was concerned, I couldn't be too careful when it came to my mate and unborn child. Nugget. Her nickname for the baby cracked me up. When we returned from the ER visit, she tried to protest, but I insisted on carrying her inside. She finally gave in. I knew she didn't need to be carried, but I needed to be close to her, and I wasn't beneath using whatever excuse I could. I sniffed her hair, breathing in her sweet scent. Inside, I placed her on the couch despite the fact that she looked exasperated with me. I'll bring you a blanket. Do you need anything else? Food? Water? She rolled her eyes and held up a finger. One, a blanket? It's 90 degrees outside and the air conditioning in here cools it off only enough for the heat to be tolerable. I don't need a blanket. Two, it's a teeny tiny burn. I'm not recovering from major surgery. And three, I don't need you to bring me food or drink. I can feed myself. Fine. Okay. Well, it's nearing dinner time. I just thought you might be hungry. If you are, I don't mind getting you something. Why don't you let me clean up the kitchen while you relax a little? She narrowed her eyes suspiciously. You do that? Sure. And if you get hungry, I'll order something. Pizza, DoorDash, Grubhub, whatever you want. Here, let me put something on TV. I stopped because I realized neither of us had bothered having cable service connected, so that was out. No cable, but I can hook my MacBook up to the TV and you can watch Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, YouTube, whatever you want. She scrunched her forehead. You know how to do that? Before I could answer, she waved the question away. Of course you know how to do that. What am I thinking? I forgot, genius tech guy. I grinned. I didn't exactly think of myself as a genius, but the description was flattering and, although a little sarcastic, I couldn't say I wasn't tickled she said it. I waited for her to respond, but her look was blank. I wasn't sure if she was going to go for it and let me set her up, or if she was going to tell me where I could insert my MacBook and how far up it should be shoved. I thought fast, remembering the Klingon costume she'd been wearing when we met. And really, was that something anyone could forget? Ever? Are you a Star Trek fan? When her face lit up and she looked interested, I gave myself a mental pat on the back. I was a pretty big fan in college. Why? I fake coughed. Ah, no reason in particular. The Klingon costume you were wearing when we met made me a little suspicious is all. I grinned. She blushed. Oh, yeah, duh. She adjusted her position but remained curled up on the couch. I noticed a hint of dark circles under her eyes. She was tired. She might be overworking herself. I'd do whatever I could to get her to stay on the couch and relax tonight. She shrugged. I used to work comic cons all over the state of Florida when I was in college. You spoke Klingon. Were you a Trekkie? Oh yeah, I was. I guess I still am. Let's see. She thought for a moment. 
Hell hook nick kach jas vach. That was an easy one. Every Trekkie wannabe knew that one. It was the Klingon battle cry. I straightened and raised my chin, taking on the stance of a proud Klingon warrior. Hell hook nick kach jas vach. Today is a good day to die. Her giggle made me feel ten feet taller. It was thrilling to finally see her laugh when she looked at me, rather than scowl in anger or draw back in trepidation. I can't believe you're a Trekkie too. She looked down and picked at a piece of imaginary lint on her yoga pants, grinning shyly. I was actually a huge nerd in high school and college. I read sci-fi and fantasy novels and played Dungeons and Dragons the whole bit. Now I was really surprised. You played D&D? Me too. I ran a few campaigns. You were a dungeon master? Don't want to brag or anything. I exhaled on my fingernails and buffed them on my shirt jokingly in an I'm a hot shot gesture. I felt like a rock star when again a smile stretched across her pretty face. All right, let me go get my MacBook and connecting cable and you can pick out something to watch. Ellen scrolled through streaming services while I cleaned up the kitchen. Even though she'd said she didn't want anything to eat, I sliced a few pieces of the freshly baked bread and slathered it with butter. When I returned with the snack, she was asleep, snoring softly. I sat in the corner armchair watching her. I would have rather been on the couch next to her or holding her in my lap, but I didn't want to push my luck. She seemed to be enjoying my company the past half hour or so. Okay, enjoying might be a stretch. Tolerating? She'd been tolerating my company. I kept staring at her. She was an exciting anomaly. She looked like the cross between a fashion model and a cheerleader, but she was a total nerd. I was debating whether or not I should carry her to her bed and tuck her in when my cell rang. I had placed it on the dining room table while I was cleaning and jumped up to get it before it woke Ellen. The screen flashed. Jake James. What's going on, Jake? Tell me my house is still standing. Better than standing. The water lines have been replaced and tested. Plumbing's done. You have hot water. And except for a couple of days worth of cosmetic stuff, the place is ready for you. It's livable, man. I glanced over at Ellen. She was no longer asleep. When her eyes met mine, it was obvious she'd heard Jake's voice reverberating through the phone and around the otherwise quiet room. That was quick. You sure you don't need a couple more days? It's fine if you do. Not at all. We've been working practically around the clock, per your instructions. It's ready. You can move back tonight. Fuck. I knew Ellen heard that. It was going to be a lot harder to come up with excuses to see her when we weren't under the same roof. Thanks, Jake, I ended the call. Ellen sat up, swung her legs off the couch, and placed her feet on the floor. Great, your place is done. That means you're out of here tonight, right? Well, unless you need. Dylan, I don't need anything except for you to leave. Go. You sure I could? Yes, I'm sure. Right, okay. Why had I told them to rush the construction? I'd like to kick my own ass for that. Three hours later, I had all my stuff moved back to my place and my eyes trained on the second-story, south-facing corner window. I watched Ellen's bedroom light go out. Leaning back against the palm tree, my legs crossed at the ankles, I listened to the gulf waters as they gently rolled over the sand before receding. I'd call Ellen in the morning, just to check on her, but until the early rays broke the horizon... I'd stay right there, keeping watch over her. Chapter 16, Dylan I was sitting on my back porch, watching the ocean, when Parker found me. I heard her knocking and yelling through the door, but I was on the third floor balcony and didn't feel like going down just for her to give me attitude. Parker Pettit wasn't one to take being ignored lightly, though. When I heard her screaming from under me, I looked over the edge of the railing and saw her glaring up. Hey, dickhead, we need to talk. I sighed loudly, so I was sure she'd hear me. It's about you-know-who, 
A certain someone with blue eyes and blonde hair and a cute little baby bump? And if that's not enough of a hint, her name's Ellen and you're the baby bump's daddy. The neighbor to my right, Mrs. Glainville, stepped out onto her porch with a tall glass of sweet tea and a folding paper fan and perched on her lawn chair. She unfolded her paper fan and flapped it in front of her as she stared first at Parker and then at me, as though she was watching her daytime soaps. Shameless. I sighed. Want to come in? Parker glared. That's why I was knocking. As she headed around the side of the house to the front door, I heard her shout. Stay tuned, neighbor lady. This could prove to be quite the show. Sighing, I went inside and hurried down the stairs to let her in. Parker stomped inside and then walked around whistling. Nice digs. This is snazzy. You must come from money or something. I shrugged. Or something. I was having a hard time appreciating any of it. Anyway, back to why I came over here. You are a raging asshole, Dylan Lion King. I didn't think it was possible with you. You've been nothing but kind and smart and charming since I met you. Everyone who knows you sings your praises, yet you were a raging, roaring dumbass with Ellen. What gives? I sank onto the couch and groaned. I screwed up. No shit. She sat across from me and crossed her arms. Ellen is amazing and beautiful and carrying your cub. I winced. I know all that, I know. She's all that and more. Parker was nodding. She is a catch. Any man would be thrilled to bring her home, yet you tossed her out like yesterday's trash. It's not like that. I'm betting you it is to her. I growled, frustrated beyond frustrated. Well, it doesn't exactly matter now. We're no longer under the same roof, and I don't know if she'll ever forgive me. Cut me a break. I may have to live the rest of my life following her from a distance. I scrubbed my hands down my face. Doubtful. Your mates. She'll forgive you, eventually. But you're the one who fucked up, so the onus is on you to fix it. She leaned forward. So, how are you going to do that? I thought of the hurt and anger on Ellen's face and how walking around hurt and angry for the next seven months might affect both her and Nugget. I didn't know if I was going to be able to make up for the pain I'd caused her or make her see why I did what I did. Oh, you stupid kitty. You're not going to do anything? Parker stood up and stomped a foot so hard I was surprised it didn't go through the floor. I growled and leaped to my feet. What the fuck am I supposed to do? Lions aren't supposed to mate humans. I have no idea how to go about this. Fate fucked up. I researched that, and guess what? It's not unheard of. It's happened before. I know it's happened before. I've seen it. The results are disastrous. I let out a raging roar and grabbed a pillow from the couch, easily ripping it in half. Pillow stuffing shot into the air and rained down like snowfall. All righty then. Parker watched as I moved to the next pillow and shredded that, too. She didn't seem the least bit intimidated. How was it a pint-sized bunny shifter had no fear of a furious, raging lion shifter? There was something wrong with her. When you've finished your tantrum, I want to know what the hell you mean you've seen it. Where? How? With whom? I plopped down on the couch, sending another cloudburst of stuffing into the air. My parents. My mom was not only half-human, but her human side had an exceptionally soft heart, one made for love. My dad was a lion. To him, relationships with females were emotionless. Business transactions, nothing more. It did not end well. Parker shrugged her shoulders. Well, fate rules. You would know that if you got your head out of your ass for one minute. Whatever your mommy and daddy issues are, get over it. Fate's not listening, doesn't care, and for some unknown reason, decided that you deserve a beautiful, warm, sweet, somewhat nerdy woman who will love you forever. But you vetoed that. Idiot. Parker rolled her eyes. She may be pushing you away right now, for her own self-preservation and because she's hurt, but she needs you. So stop sitting around crying in your cornflakes. 
What am I supposed to do? She narrowed her eyes and hesitated for dramatic effect. Fix it. I shook my head. Oh, not you two. Great advice. Fix it. Stellar. Seems to be the only advice I can get lately. I hope you're not a smartass when you talk to your mate. I hope you learn to mind your own business someday. She huffed a laugh. <laughs> like that's gonna happen. She opened the front door and sighed. Oh, and congratulations. I threw the limp, shredded pillowcase in her direction, but she'd already squeezed through the door and shut it behind her. I sat, thinking for a long time, until I came up with an idea. It might not have been the best idea ever, but to a desperate man, it was a lifeline. And I was a desperate man. Chapter 17 Ellen the house on Lover's Lane was a grand, three-story home that I would guess was built in the early 20th century, maybe earlier. I stood on the front walk admiring it for a moment, before moving forward and ascending the stairs. I rang the bell, then knocked. The client had used my online scheduling system to book a cooking lesson, and from the drop-down of items to choose had selected brownies with caramel sauce. I had a shopping bag of supplies with me. My jaw dropped when the door swung open and Dylan was on the other side. His lips were curved in a goofy grin and his green gold eyes almost seemed to glow. I hadn't seen him in a couple days and I couldn't help it. My heart fluttered and the breath left my lungs. What was he doing here? This was my client. Then it hit me. I wanted to smack myself, just a slap or two on the off chance it would serve to knock some sense into me. This is your house? He nodded. Bingo. Please don't be mad. I just wanted to see you, and to learn to bake, of course. Of course. I wasn't mad, not exactly. Even though this whole thing was flying more red flags than a red flag company, I'd missed him. I hated that I missed him, but I did miss him. Besides, he looked adorable. His golden hair was tousled in a carefree style. His dark t-shirt stretched over his sculpted chest and rock-hard biceps, and combined with the sexy, goofy half-grin had my mouth watering. A shiver ran through me. A warm flush of arousal flowed from my head to my toes just from looking at the man. He stepped aside and motioned me in. When I didn't move, he pleaded, Come on, just give me a chance. Finally, I shrugged and brushed past him into the house. It's your dime, Oliver. He'd booked the session under the name Oliver Closeoff. How in the hell had I fallen for that name? It was as bad as Seymour Butts. Immature, childish. I stifled a grin. Funny. I didn't look around too much before he ushered me into the kitchen, but from what I could tell, it was clean and tastefully decorated. Except for the couch pillows that were shredded and oddly devoid of stuffing. The kitchen was newly remodeled. Nice kitchen. I sat the bags of groceries and supplies on the counter. Thanks. As he pitched in and started helping me unpack, the nearness of him drove me insane. I didn't know what was wrong with me today. Hormones? My body responded to him like he was a narcotic. I was overcome by a powerful and overwhelming onslaught of raw physical desire. So, boss, what do we do first? Oh, Lord. His voice was like warm rain dancing against my skin. Moisture pooled between my legs. I suddenly wondered if he could scent how aroused I was. He was able to scent the pregnancy, so probably. My cheeks heated at the realization. As though I was standing outside my body, I directed Dylan to turn the oven on to preheat, then combine the cream, brown sugar, and butter in a saucepan on the stove and begin making the caramel sauce. As we waited for it to warm, his eyes raked over me with a look of such heated desire that I knew unequivocally I wasn't the only one affected. 
I sucked in a sharp breath, a needy pulsing ignited in my belly. Dylan's smolderingly sexy gaze said exactly what was on his mind. He took a step toward me. I knew I should stop him before this went any further, but I couldn't bring myself to push him away. My body craved him like I was under a spell. Heat shot through my veins, liquid lava. How was it the man was able to breach my every defense? Dylan, what are we doing? I didn't know what dance we were dancing, but I wanted his arms around me again. I'm playing it by ear, but right now, the idea running through my head is to worship your body until you can't live without me. He lifted me off the floor like I weighed nothing and sat me atop his kitchen counter. He was inches from me now. I could feel his breath on my face. Say the word and I'll stop. It'll kill me, but I'll stop. His voice was husky with desire. Stop? Was he crazy? I needed this like I needed my next breath. Do not stop. The moment the words left my lips, he slid my skirt up and buried his face between my legs. His mass of thick golden hair tickled my thighs. Pulling my panties off with his teeth, he ran his tongue over the length of my pussy before circling my clit. Holy shit, from zero to sixty in 2.7 seconds. I arched my back and threaded my fingers through his hair. His hands slid over the outside of my legs as he worked his magic with his mouth, sliding his tongue in and out of me before running it up to encircle my clit. He continued the pattern moving faster and faster until a familiar tingling started deep in my core. I moaned softly. He was so in tune with my responses that he instantly dropped his pants to the floor, and the next thing I knew, I was staring at every glorious inch of him. Say yes. His hands were wrapped around my legs, his fingers digging into my thighs. He was right there, poised to enter me. Say yes. Swept in a maelstrom of desire, I wanted nothing more than to have him inside me. Say yes. Yes, yes, damn it, yes. It happened so fast I didn't even realize what was going on until his hands grabbed my ass and slid me off the counter and on to his thick length. He entered me an inch at a time until I was completely full, then turned us and slammed my back against the opposite wall. He thrust into me again and again, sending me into a state of sheer ecstasy. I clawed at his back, and at one point I thought I heard my moaning become screaming. He didn't stop. He knew what I needed. With each push and thrust, my body released the tension and anxiety I'd felt building up for the last week. No, not week, months, the last two months. My heels dug into his ass and my fingers dug into his shoulders. The electric sparks in my core began to build, and every time he thrust into me until our pelvises met, the sparks grew more intense. My head rolled back as wild, delicious waves of pleasure enveloped my body, and I climaxed in a tidal wave of bliss. Dylan let loose his own climax, and we were suddenly in the shower, soaked. No, that couldn't be right. The kitchen was a shower? Yeah, what? A sharp noise blared so loudly it hurt my ears. Next thing I knew, Dylan was carrying me in his arms as he raced outside. I was still dazed coming down from my orgasm and not quite sure what was going on until he opened the door of his truck and sat me in the passenger seat. Stay here. The sprinkler system took care of the fire, but I need you to stay safe and away from the damage. That was when it hit. A kitchen fire? That was crazy. We'd been so wrapped up in each other, we hadn't even realized what was going on around us. It seemed like only minutes later, a fire truck pulled up out front and Mac stepped out. Great. Neither Dylan nor Mac looked too happy to see each other. I readied myself to run out and break up a fight, but it didn't happen. They entered the house together while the other guys remained in the truck. I assumed that was a good sign. 
When they emerged unscathed and alive, I breathed a sigh of relief. Good thing you had the sprinkler system, although the water did more damage than the fire. What were you doing that you were so preoccupied you forgot you had something on the stove? Dylan stood straighter, grinning from ear to ear. I was making love to my woman. I slumped lower in the passenger seat, mortified. Mac laughed. I figured. Sounds like things are looking up for you two. Maybe don't try cooking at the same time. Mac noticed me in the truck and waved. I groaned, but gave a feeble wave back. Dylan hissed viciously. I was embarrassed that Dylan felt he needed to be jealous or threatened by Mac's friendliness toward me, but Mac laughed it off. You two are quite the pair. I don't get the impression that things are completely fixed yet, but good luck. Mac nodded to Dylan, then winked at me before turning to go. Dylan hissed again. Mac laughed more loudly. Instigator. When the fire truck was gone, Dylan sauntered over to me and opened the passenger door, grinning. So, looks like I'm moving back in with you. Excuse me? He shrugged. I've got nowhere else to go now that you've burned my house down. One, it's not the whole house, and two, how are you blaming me? You're the one who- Before I finished my sentence, his lips were on me, and he was kissing me. Sneaky tactic, but no complaints here. I couldn't say I minded the thought of having Dylan under the same roof again. In fact, I was thinking it might be really nice to have him under the same roof on a permanent basis, until I remembered that if it weren't for the fact I was pregnant, he wouldn't be giving me the time of day. A part of me wanted to throw caution to the wind, grab onto Dylan, and never let go. But the part that knew the only reason he was sticking around was that I'd gotten pregnant was bigger. Much bigger. That didn't make him a bad guy, but it wasn't what I wanted, and I wouldn't settle for it. Pain sliced me like a steel blade. Chapter 18. Dylan On the way back to Patton's old bachelor pad, I left a message on James Construction's voicemail, giving them the good news about needing my kitchen redone. Seconds after I hung up, I sensed Ellen's shift in emotion from joy and contentment to sorrow. Then, I scented her pain. It was sharp and bitter and hit me like a fist. Fix it. I was her mate, she needed me, and I'd do whatever it took to make this right for her. We had an hour or so before twilight. Mind if we go for a little drive? I don't know, please. I promised to explain things about why I ran off after we first met, and I never got the chance. I want to show you something that I think will help do that. She shrugged, reluctantly agreeing. I drove us to a destination just outside of Miami, where I pulled up and parked next to the eight-foot-tall wrought iron fence. The entrance gates were open. You brought me to a cemetery? My mom's buried here. She nodded reverently and opened her door to get out. Before she could, I was around to her side of the truck lifting her. I placed her gently on the ground, and she let me take her hand and lead her silently to the marble headstone. The word farewell was cut into the stone. Underneath, in smaller letters read, Mary King, Beloved Wife and Mother. My best and worst memories were of my mother. I glanced at Ellen, who was watching me closely. She was soft and tender-hearted. She died when I was seven. I'm so sorry. How did she die? Cancer. Ellen stared at me for a second before her eyes narrowed. I could see her mind churning, formulating the question that I hoped she'd ask. Forgive the question, but I thought shifters were immune to human diseases. We are, usually. The shifter doctor said my mom was the only case of cancer he'd ever seen in a shifter. Said it might have been some sort of genetic mutation from her half-human side. But I knew. Everyone knew. She gave up. 
I stooped to clear the area around the gravestone of small twigs and debris that had collected since the last time I'd been there. If it wasn't cancer, it would have been something else, some other disease, no matter how rare or unusual, that she fell victim to, because she gave up the will to live. She wanted to die. I heard Ellen gasp. And you watched this happen? As a child? I nodded. I wasn't old enough to understand the dynamics of adult relationships, but I knew enough about what was happening with her. Whenever my dad would come by, she was distraught. When he left, she'd cry for weeks. Sometimes she'd just stay in bed for days, not eating. Ellen looked puzzled. My mom didn't grow up around shifters. She had no idea about the structure of a lion shifter pride. When my father took her as a wife, she hadn't a clue that he already had six wives or that she'd be his seventh. Wow, that must have been a shock. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I wasn't sure if Ellen was grasping what I was getting at. The thing is, when she found out, she didn't leave my dad. She was already bonded and pregnant. Instead, she withered away, a little more each day until she finally died. Dylan, I'm so sorry. I brought you here for a reason, to help explain why I did what I did. When I met you, dressed in a Klingon uniform, I grinned at the memory. At first, I didn't understand what I was feeling, only that you knocked me off my feet. I was literally hours from starting my own pride. When I realized what was going on between us, I couldn't get past comparing us to my parents and the horrible fate that awaited you unless I protected you by pushing you away. Wait, you're telling me that I reminded you of your mother? She was like you in some ways. I sensed her anger bubbling. Dylan, that doesn't make sense. Were you planning to lie to me and marry six other women behind my back? No, I was scared and stupid and I'm sorry for pushing you away. It was the wrong move. Do you think you can forgive me? I don't know, Dylan. It hurts so much. She kicked the toe of her shoe at the dirt. The thing I wanted most in the world was a family, to be enough for someone. I wanted to find a man who loved me and appreciated me, flaws and all, and wouldn't leave. What I found was a man who didn't want me until he found out I was pregnant. I'm not sure that I can just pretend like that isn't something that happened. I nodded, not wanting to downplay her concern. It wasn't how I felt. It was never that way for me. It was never that I didn't want you or that you weren't enough. When you questioned me about whether I'd be asking to be part of your life if you weren't pregnant, what I meant was that it was the pregnancy that made me face my fears. I never meant that I didn't want to be in your life when you weren't pregnant, because I did. I was just afraid then. I missed you every day. I stalked you, for God's sake. Ellen's eyes went wide. What? You stalked me? Why? With a finger, I tucked a strand of her hair behind her ear and ran my fingertip along her jaw. Because you're my mate. I am? She sounded shocked. Wait, everyone said that lions don't have mates. I grunted. They don't, usually. I've never known any lion to have a mate other than my mom and me. Chapter 19, Ellen Dylan flashed his megawatt smile, and I tried to contain the excitement building in me. The way he was talking, it made my head spin. He'd used the M word. I'd convinced myself that I would never have a mate, and now he was dangling it like a carrot, the thing I wanted more than anything in the world. All the pieces seemed to be falling into place like a jigsaw puzzle. Learning about Dylan's past explained a lot, and he seemed different. There was a peace around him. My thoughts were going haywire, but I realized it was almost dark and we were alone in a secluded cemetery. I have a question. Anything, ask me anything. 
Will you show me your lion? My breath hitched in my throat as I watched Dylan remove his clothes. It was warm out, but I wrapped my arms around myself, shivering in anticipation. When the largest lion I had ever seen ripped from him with such a force that a ripple of power radiated outward, I gasped and took a step back. He was almost twice the size of any zoo lion. His paws were as big as my head. I suddenly became a little frightened. I'd forgotten to ask if his consciousness was still present when he shifted into his lion. Surely he wouldn't risk shifting around me if he couldn't control the huge jungle beast he turned into, right? A sound rumbled from deep in his chest. It sounded like a purr. Then he circled me, rubbing against my body affectionately, like a house cat, except his back came up nearly to my shoulder. He was gorgeous, magnificent. I ran my fingers through his thick, coarse mane, giggling in delight. He was the perfect specimen of male lion, chestnut mane, luxurious golden coat, and an air of primal dominance. The lines of his body hinted at the raw power his beast possessed. He sat beside me and blinked slowly, his eyes golden and glowing. I stroked his fur for several minutes before he changed back and I found myself petting the hair of a naked man. I pulled my hand back like his head was a hot stove, but my enthusiasm and sheer joy couldn't be diminished. That was amazing, just m amazing. Yeah? He grinned, clearly pleased by my reaction. As Dylan dressed, I rubbed my baby bump. Nugget would one day shift into a beautiful creature like that, alongside his or her daddy. We walked back to the truck in silence. I was lost in thought. I imagined Dylan shifting with our child for the first time, explaining all the things about shifters that I couldn't. I wanted to at least be there, be a part of it. When we reached the truck, Dylan held his hand out to help me in, and a warmth spread through me. I looked into his eyes, now more green than gold, and saw everything I ever wanted within my reach. But could I trust it? After the way he practically devoured me in his kitchen a couple of hours ago, he did seem to truly want me. I wanted him too, but I was scared. Dylan could crush me if he ever decided to leave again. As if reading my mind, he kissed my forehead. We're meant to be together, made for each other. My heart thudded against my ribcage. You believe that? He turned my face so I was staring at him. With my whole heart. Dylan had conquered his fear. I had yet to conquer mine, he wanted to be my mate forever, and there was no hesitation when he said it. He meant it. Uh, I need time to think about it. He nodded, but his smile held a devious glint. I got the impression that while he agreed to give me the time I asked for, he was just biding his own time until he pounced. Chapter 20 Ellen I just finished editing and uploading my latest video and was getting to work on the accompanying blog post when Parker called and asked me if I could whip up some baked goods for a wedding bash she was throwing for Flynn and Arden. Apparently, her shifter friends weren't stuffy enough for the wedding shower Arden's mom and sisters were throwing, so Parker, Layla, and Fern decided to throw a party shifter style. My heart was filled with joy for my bestie, Arden. If anyone deserved a lifetime of happiness, it was her and Flynn. I volunteered to bake a cake and sweets for the party. While Dylan sat at the dining room table and worked on his computer, I gathered ingredients. Although his eyes hardly left the screen, I could tell he was completely aware of me and every movement I made. I was cutting layers in the cake and hadn't realized he'd gotten up and moved behind me until he brushed his hand across my hip. I jumped and giggled when I felt him so close. Hey, you're not filming this? Nope, this is special for Arden and Flynn's party. 
Can I help? I looked back at him and bit my lip. Seriously? What do you know about cake decorating? Not a thing, but you can teach me, right? I faked a serious, intense look. On one condition. No burning down the house, Lion King. He growled lightly and nipped the back of my neck. That nickname has to go, Ellen. I like it, he sighed. Fine, just not in public. I hid a grin and shrugged. We'll see. So, talk me through this. I showed him how I layered the cakes and then soaked them in simple syrup before stacking them with layers of buttercream and lemon curd. In truth, he ate more than he helped, but it was more enjoyable doing it with him, and it made my heart feel lighter to pretend I didn't notice as he stole spoonful after spoonful of frosting. Want to be my date to the party? He licked his fingers and kept his eyes on the cake, acting like he hadn't just entered the awkward no man's land between us. I stopped with my spatula halfway to the cake. A blob of icing fell onto the kitchen counter. Looking up at him through my lashes, I forced myself to lighten my grip on the spatula. Okay. He reached over and scooped up the buttercream blob and held a finger out to me. Taste? I swallowed hard. Unable to decline, I opened my mouth for him. Instead of letting me lick the icing from his finger, he smeared it across my lips and then closed the gap between us and cleaned it off with his tongue. I'm still waiting for you to let me know when you're ready, Ellen. He kissed me once more and then backed away. I have to go check on something, but I'll pick you up before the party. My vagina was screaming at him. I'm ready, I'm ready. Fuck the party and the cake. Better yet, fuck me. Yet I said nothing. He grinned like he could hear my lady bits crying out, but would wait until the words came from my mouth. In my attempt to calm down and cool off, I ended up over-baking. I made cookies, lemon bars, cherry tarts, and a huge batch of brownies. When that wasn't enough, I dug through my fridge and threw together a veggie dip. I told myself to just end this limbo, let go of the fear that he'd leave me broken and humiliated. I heard his truck pull up outside when he returned, but I was busy slicing, arranging, and packaging the baked goods for the short ride. Fifteen minutes later, when he still hadn't come inside, I became alarmed. I decided to go see what he'd been doing outside for so long, but before I made it to the front door, Dylan walked through it, wearing a huge smile. There you are. I'm loaded down with food here. I could use a hand. His eyes widened when he saw all the baked goods. To his credit, though, instead of commenting on how I'd overdone it, he hugged me and pressed a kiss to the top of my head. We'll take your car. The first thing I saw outside in the driveway was the biggest bright red ribbon with a huge loopy bow that I'd ever seen. It was wrapped around a car. Whoa, whoa, what? It's a present for you. Me? Are you kidding me right now? You bought me a car? Not just any car, a Tesla. My old car was fine, but not the safest. This Tesla carries the highest safety rating and gives off no toxic fumes. My shoes crunched along the gravel drive as I walked the length of the car, admiring the shiny black exterior from every angle. Should I accept it? I knew Dylan had money, but still, it was a huge gift. He must have seen the indecision on my face because before I could voice it, he held his hands up, silently asking me to hear him out. This isn't me trying to control you or assert my macho dominance. It's just so I know that you and Nugget are safe. I need that. My lion needs it. Plus, well, I just wanted to give you something. Can you please just say thank you and accept it? Please? I stared into his eyes for a few beats, then a broad grin spread across my face. Thank you. I accept. Then I squealed in glee. Dylan slapped a hand to his chest and breathed an exaggerated sigh of relief.
He handed me a key card to unlock the door. Once you download the app to your phone, you can use that to lock and unlock the door as well as perform other operations. Operations? Wow, it's like a shuttlecraft. I tapped the key card where he showed me near the driver's window and slid behind the wheel. There was no instrument panel. The tachometer, speedometer, odometer, and fuel gauge were all missing. Everything was displayed and controlled with the computer monitor attached to the center of the dash. It was like a spaceship. When Dylan rounded the car, he slid into the passenger seat wearing a stern expression. Captain, we've lost communication from Starfleet and are cleared to depart from the Enterprise. I threw my head back and laughed. Fire tachyon bursts at will. I couldn't seem to contain my excitement. This is next level cool. I turned to inspect the back seating area and had to blink back the moisture that rimmed my eyes when I saw that he'd already installed a car seat for Nugget. Chapter 21, Dylan I grinned with pride as I watched a pink tinge creep up Ellen's cheeks. She stood next to her friends as they all raved about her baking. She'd overdone it, but that wasn't surprising. The woman's head may be a hamster wheel of indecision over me, but I wasn't going anywhere. Her fears, and that's what they were, would go away in time, and I'd be right here when she was ready to accept me. I grinned at the way she kept glancing over at me. I hadn't pushed. I told her I'd let her have the time she needed, and I meant it. Patton and Jake had come through for me. They'd fix the kitchen after I'd nearly burned it down, but they'd also made some changes. I'd bend over backward to make Ellen happy and give her everything she needed and wanted. While she shot glances my way, I just smiled at her, letting her know I saw her. I did. All of her. There was so much grit and determination in my mate. Even when she was sad, she was strong. She had no intention of ever giving up, even if she had to raise our baby alone. She was nothing like my mother in that respect, and I damn sure wasn't my father. I'd been a fool. Thank God I'd come to my senses. She'd never have to raise Nugget alone, because I wasn't going anywhere. Maybe most lion shifters didn't have mates, but I did. Once I got over that, it was easy to see that life wasn't worth living without her beside me. I took after my mom, not my dad. Patton came up next to me and chuckled. Still pining away for just one woman? Never thought I'd see the day. I growled. She's mine. He sniffed the air and elbowed me. I'm not scenting a claiming mark. I shook my head. I'd been taking his goading nonstop the past few days. Fuck off. Show her the house yet? I'm going to murder you, you know that? He just laughed and slapped my back. Get in line. It's long. Ellen looked over at me and laughed when Layla said something to her. Her eyes crinkled in the corners. Then, tucking her lip between her teeth, she put her juice down and came toward me. My body stiffened, desire racing through me. It was always like that, a constant struggle to hide my arousal from her so as not to push her or make her feel threatened. I hoped, soon, I wouldn't have to hide anymore how badly I wanted her. She licked her lips and stopped right in front of me. Do you want something to eat? My stomach clenched. I damn sure did. It wasn't on the menu, though. Smiling down at her, I brushed her hair behind her ears. Only if you eat with me. Patton grunted as he walked by. Ellen giggled and leaned into me, bracing herself with a hand on my chest. Patton made some wise crack, but I wasn't paying attention to him. My mate was looking up at me with an expression on her face that I couldn't place. I held her hips and raised a brow. What's up? How do you feel about wrinkles? I chuckled, surprised by the odd question. I don't usually feel anything about them. On me. Her smile faded. How are you going to feel when you wake up one morning, look over at me, and I'm old and wrinkled? I'm going to feel like the luckiest son of a bitch in the world. 
I grinned down at her and kissed her forehead, then her temple, then the tip of her nose. As long as I get to watch each one form, I will love every wrinkle on your face and anywhere else, provided they're on you. Her lips parted, then closed. Then she sucked in a deep breath. What if I get fat? What if you look up one day and I've eaten all the brownies and I'm as big as a house? I growled and yanked her body against mine. I won't like that, not unless you leave some brownies for me. You'll always be beautiful to me, now or later, whatever you weigh, because you're you, my mate. Her eyes missed it over, but she blinked it away and nodded. I think I'm ready, then. I stared down at her, hoping I heard what I thought I just heard, and that I wasn't interpreting her words wrongly. You're ready for... For us to be mates. That knocked the breath out of my lungs, and I stood staring down at her for several seconds. Then a mad rush of adrenaline shot through me, along with the determination to prove to her that she owned me. Lightly easing her away from me, I climbed on one of the dining table chairs and cleared my throat to gain the attention of the room. Oh my god, Dylan, get down. Excuse me, listen up, everyone. I met Ellen's eyes and grinned widely. Ellen and I are mates, and we are going to spend the rest of our lives together, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, wherever life takes us, till death do us part. My voice softened as I looked down into her eyes. When I breathe my last breath, I will die loving her. The place exploded with whoops and cheers, and Ellen buried her face in her hands and groaned. Dylan! I stepped down and went down to my knees in front of her. Holding her hips, I waited until she looked at me. If we have one child, if we have ten children, I will love them all. But you'll always be my number one, my queen. Get up! She giggled and pulled at my arms. If I'd have known you were this corny and sentimental, I never would have agreed to this. Now get up. Not until you promise to move into my place with me. I'll move in if you get up. Louder. I want to really believe it. Laughing full out, she raised her voice. I'll move in. One more time. I'll move in with you. I stood up and pulled her into a hot kiss. When she panted against my lips, I pulled back and fought to keep my hands off her ass. There, that settled. Parker let out a bark of laughter. Get a room. Ellen's cheeks turned red and she buried her face in my chest. Layla snorted. We all know what you two will be doing in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Patton showed up at my side, brownie in hand, nodding approval. Well played. Laughter danced around us, but I was focused on Ellen with a burning intensity. You did mean it, right? You weren't just trying to get me to shut up and stop embarrassing you, right? She gave me a nod and licked her lips. I meant it. I'm ready. Scooping her up and cradling her in my arms, I took off for the door, shouting congratulations to Arden and Flynn on the way out. Despite her protests and insistence that she could walk, I carried her the whole way, racing in the direction of my house. Our house. Chapter 22. Ellen. We're going to your house? My nerves were back as Dylan took the stairs up to his front door two at a time. I had a stupid grin on my face and a swarm of butterflies in my stomach. We are. He held me in his arms as he walked into the house wearing a proud smile. He didn't put me down until we were inside. Only it's our house. I gaped at him and then looked around. Everything was pristine, shiny, clean, and perfect. No sign of smoke or fire or water damage. It smelled fresh. I chewed on my lip and moved away from him, taking my time to explore. When I walked into the kitchen, I felt as though I'd stepped into the pages of a magazine. The kitchen was nice before we set it on fire, but now, wow. The granite countertop seemed to go on for miles, and there were new restaurant-quality stainless steel appliances. 
I told James Construction to outfit it with all the latest top-of-the-line appliances, but if there's anything else you need, we'll add it, and if there's anything you don't like, we'll replace it. I could already picture myself baking there, and there was plenty of natural lighting for my videos. I was so excited, I covered my mouth and giggled into my hands, which seemed to thrill Dylan to no end. The living room was equally as tasteful and pristine, but there was something cold and barren about it. It took me a minute to figure it out. There are no pictures. He pulled his phone out of his pocket and came over to me. Pressing his lips against my cheek, he snapped a selfie of us. <laughs> what a dork. I was hoping we could fill the walls with pictures of me, you, and Nugget, our family. Our family. My heart fluttered, and I blinked to clear away the tears. I... Yes, our family. He kissed me, but pulled back too quickly. Come on. Before I finished checking everything out, he was pulling me up the stairs. I thought maybe we were going to the master bedroom, but when we passed a large bedroom that was clearly the master, I frowned. Where are we going? Sex dungeon. I choked on my saliva and my cheeks burned red hot. What? He nodded to the last door on the right and winked. Go on. With mild concern, I pushed open the door, hoping that if he was serious about the sex dungeon thing, he didn't have too bizarre a kink, and it wouldn't be anything excessively painful. The gasp that escaped my lips didn't do justice to expressing how truly shocked I was. The room was large, with an entire wall of windows looking out at the ocean. Oak bookshelves lined the other three walls, and each wall had one of those rolling library ladders. But the piece de resistance was in the middle of the room. Two huge, beautiful oak desks, both facing the center of the room and each other. Dylan, those desks, they're beautiful. A his and a hers. I'll let you choose which is which. It was the most perfect office I'd ever seen. I had the desks face each other so we could both work in here and still be together. Dylan's hands rested on my shoulders, his breath a soft tickle against the back of my neck. I left the room next to the master bedroom empty. I figured you might want to decorate it yourself as a nursery, or we could do it together. You can make any changes, and you'll need to add finishing touches, anything else you might possibly need during the next seven or eight decades. My heart was so full that I wasn't sure how it still fit in my chest. I wanted to say something, but I didn't know what to say, so I spun around and jumped into his arms. He caught me, and we held each other in a silent communication, sealed with a kiss. I have one more question. He kept me held firmly in his embrace. Ask away. I grinned, now knowing the answer to the question before I asked, but giving him a chance to voice it anyway. If I wasn't pregnant, would you still want us to be together right now? He looked deep into my eyes. I can say with 100% certainty the answer to that is yes. I would want you as my mate, even if we didn't have a baby on the way. He grinned and used his head to gesture to my lower stomach. But that doesn't mean I'm not ecstatic about Nugget. When he looked back up and met my gaze, his eyes were glowing. You both mean more to me than anything in this world. He buried his face against my neck, and a rumbling came from his chest. I recognized it as his purr. I want to mark you with a claiming mark and spend the rest of my life caring for you and our family. Are you ready for that yet? If not, I'll wait until you are, no pressure. I'm on cloud nine that you're here agreeing to move in. I'm ready. I'm absolutely ready. It still scares the hell out of me, I'm not gonna lie, but it's an excited kind of fear because this is what I've wanted since I was a little girl. A family. A man who loves me and will weather life's storms with me. I held his face. You. Our bodies were molded together, so I easily felt his erection spring to life against my belly. 
The need was written all over his face. Dylan kissed me fiercely and impatiently, fueling my fire. He laid me down underneath him on the thick carpet, and I feverishly rocked my hips up against him. I needed him right then and there. He had my shirt off and pants down in the span of a breath, confirming he was as aroused as I was. I tugged at his clothes until we were naked, writhing against each other, tasting one another with hard, desperate kisses. Strong hands stroked over my body. He reached under me, grabbing my ass, lifting me, opening me, penetrating me. His forehead against mine, he eased into me until his full length was buried, filling me. I gazed into his eyes and saw devotion and desire. He wasn't going anywhere. I wrapped my legs around him and moaned into his mouth, swallowed the growls he returned. Hurtling toward a release at lightning speed, I dug my fingers into his shoulders and stretched my neck out to him. I wanted him to claim me. I wanted to be his. Dylan found my mouth once more and kissed me tenderly before clamping his teeth on my neck and sinking them into my flesh. Pleasure rocked through my body, curling my fingers and toes until it broke free and I released a shattering cry. Dylan roared as he climaxed with me, his body pressed tightly to mine. The rest of the world did not exist as we came down from heaven and our breathing normalized. By the time I could work my muscles again, my arms were stiff from being locked around him. When they flopped free of him, he rolled to the side, pulling me with him. I should have carried you to the bed, he groaned. I keep resolving to be romantic and create something special for you, and then I take you on the hallway carpet like an animal. I grinned and wiggled my eyebrows at him. Well, don't say it. He rolled his eyes but grinned back at me. You'll be outnumbered soon in the animal department. He kissed the tip of my nose. I'll get it right one of these days. You already have. Beds are overrated. But don't get me wrong, I'm relieved that's an office in there and not a sex dungeon. He barked a laugh, then pulled me on top of his chest and sighed happily. Hey, let's go get your stuff and officially move you in here. What? I frowned. You mean now? He shrugged and sat up leaning on his elbows. You know what they say, there's no time like the present. Standing, he held a hand out to me. Come on, it won't take long. I'm strong, I can carry a lot in one load. Of course you are. I winked teasingly and slid my hand in his to let him help me to my feet. We dressed, and before we made it to the stairs, he bent and scooped me into his arms. I held on. He whispered into my hair as he easily carried me down the stairs. You've made me a very happy man. Tears formed, but I blinked them away. Damn hormones. When we reached the front door, he paused. His face had grown serious, but he spoke in Klingon. Ba, we, shoo. I couldn't fight the tears after hearing that. They flooded my eyes and spilled down my cheeks. With a huge smile and my whole heart, which was now a lump in my throat, I repeated the phrase back to him. Bah, we, shu. You are my love. The End Stay tuned for book six in the series, Craved Mate. Thank you for listening. This has been Chosen Mate, Lion Shifter Romance, Cyber Mates Book Five. Written by Candace Ayers, narrated by Maeve York. Stay tuned for the final book in the series, Cybermates Book 6, Craved Mate, Wolf Shifter Rom-Com Romance.